Welcome, everyone, to a fresh edition of Draft on Tap. My name is Aldo Gandia, and we've got to do it. We've got to talk about Caleb Williams and his pro day. Danny's going to give us a scouting report a little later. We've got a great interview coming up. Before we bring in our interviewee, let me bring in Danny Shimon. Danny, how are you, my friend? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm doing awesome. Uh, it's getting, what, 35 days until until the draft gets here? So it's, it's right. getting closer and closer. So Christmas Day for me is, is, is getting closer here. And obviously the, 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 the film study, it's, it's kind of kicked up a notch here, getting more deeper and deeper. And finally... You got what you wanted, Aldo. You've got my top 10 quarterbacks. You've been on me to give you quarterbacks, guy, and I try to push it off and push it off. But with the inevitable trade that happened this past week, which I know we'll get to later, um, we're going to be breaking down quarterbacks today. Yeah, I asked you back in October. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It wasn't that long. I try to, I try to push it off. You know, I try to push it off. But uh, finally, I thought to get in. I know. We'll, we'll talk about your disappointment about the Jalen Fields saga, but right now let's bring in our very, very special guest. His name is Connor Morissette. He is from uscfootball.com. Connor, uh, what else, what, what other credits uh, would you like us to mention to our followers? uscfootball.com is great. Uh, we have the Peristyle podcast, which is the USC podcast, so you can check that out too. But I know we're talking Chicago Bears and Caleb Williams today, so we can get right into it. Yeah, he had quite uh, the day. I mean, from what I heard and, uh, and read, he didn't have an exceptional, spectacular day throwing the ball, but he was effective. He only missed, according to him himself on NFL Network, he said he missed two deep throws and an intermediate throw behind his receiver. Is that pretty much what you saw? That's what I saw, too. And people have asked me about his performance today pretty consistently from – the second it ended to now and pro day is obviously important. There's a lot of scouts there, but if you have any questions about his ability, I don't know if pro day is the best evidence to point to and say, Hey, he's not the guy because he missed three throws during a, a workout on air. I think the tape tells the whole story with him. And that's why he's such a highly coveted prospect. Well, I'll turn it over to Danny Shimon, who is our tape expert. He pours through in about 30 hours a week and uh, he's still waiting for my check to arrive in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> Go at it, guys. <laughs> but, but Connor, I, I mean, uh, just to, I agree with you 100%. I mean, the whole big thing with with the, with the uh, you know, pro days, and I understand why the the media hype is all there and everything, and he's going to be the first pick in the draft most likely. But uh, the, 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 his tape is – it can tell you everything you need to know about the, about the kid in terms of his talent, right? So, uh, But obviously, you know, like I said, we're, we're here to talk about USC, and, and we're going to talk about Taj Washington. We're, no, no, just kidding. We're going we're gonna to talk about Caleb Williams. So obviously the, the big contingent of Bears were there. I, I think every every single NFL team was was representative today. Uh, we did see some clips where obviously Caleb mingled with Keenan Allen, uh, the newest Chicago Bear receiver. I saw a clip where uh, Ryan Poles, the Bears general manager, uh, shook hands with with his uh, with his father, uh, Caleb Williams' father as well. So uh, you know, describe the scene to our to our fans in terms of like you know Bear contingent and and what you see them do or. or did you see them hanging out a, a lot more with Caleb? You see some other players uh, that, that they were talking to the Bears. You know, what did you kind of observe uh, at the pro day today? Well, what I observed begins with yesterday from a Chicago Bears perspective. USC started spring practice yesterday, and we're all waiting for practice to begin. And then we see Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus just walk by us on the way to the USC football facility. So I believe they got here Monday. The pro day was today, Wednesday, but they were on campus Tuesday doing some stuff, talking to coaches, just getting a feel for Caleb Williams. That was the vibe that I was getting. So that was cool to see. I tweeted something about Ryan Poles being there. And then all of a sudden, all these Chicago people were retweeting me. And it wasn't viral, but it was a little bit viral. It, it just got way more exposure than I was expecting. So so that was funny. And then today, I, I think everything you said was true, Danny. But the, the biggest thing that, that I take away from it, so Matt Eberflus, after Caleb finishes his workout and the Bears coach, Matt Eberflus, he's leaving the field. He goes over to Carl Williams, Caleb's dad, and, and shook his hand and made a point to say goodbye to him. And I think it's a foregone conclusion that Caleb's going to be the number one pick. The Keenan Allen trade makes me feel even more strongly about that. And Keenan was, of course, there today, like you mentioned. But just the fact that they're trying to have this really strong relationship with the Williams family as well, specifically Carl Williams, going out of your way to say goodbye to a prospect's father. If that doesn't tell you they're going to pick him, I don't know what does. 
Yeah, you mentioned Keenan Allen, and something I, I didn't know. Uh, Caleb actually said it today in his in his post workout interview that him and Keenan Allen have a relationship. Do you know much about that, or and how 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 deep are they in terms of friends friendship? I don't know a ton about it, but Keenan was obviously in L.A. with the Chargers when Caleb was here with with USC as well. So that would make sense if they cross paths. And to me, that's just another example of it's a guy Caleb considers a friend, it sounds like, and the Bears pick him up, tells you again that they're going to pick this guy. They want to make the transition to professional football as easy as possible for Caleb and it looks like Keenan Allen, a guy who, yeah, he might be a little older, but he had a great year last year. He's always really consistent, a, a, a true professional, a guy who can really make a difference for a rookie quarterback. And, and you throw in that Caleb Williams already has a relationship with him. He's now on the bears again, connect the dots. Right. Right. So, you know, coming into the season, I, I was told by, by a couple of scouts that, you know, in terms of Caleb Williams, this is again, prior to this, this past season that, you know, the biggest thing with Caleb Williams is off the field stuff. Right. And, and uh, the, the, what I, the way he's described to me was, you know, is he, is he a me guy or is he a we guy, you know, and how much does he love the game? Now I've never met the, I've never met him. I've never, you know, spoken to him personally. So I, I can just go off of what I've been told about other scouts. Now, not a lot of that, those questions have to be answered obviously now through the, you know, through the pre-draft process and interviews, but you know, just just watching him on what have we've seen here in Chicago on on TV and in terms, uh, obviously he's you know he knows he's a smart kid. He knows he's got to put up a you know a, a good front there, but he just seems like a genuine guy. And and the, and the, and the one thing that w- that w- comes out with him is that you know his he's not a me guy. It doesn't appear for, again from us from this point of, point of view here. And he's a guy that teammates love, and um, and he's, he's a guy that says he loves ball. So you know, someone who, who you know like yourself has been around the program for all this time. You know, can you attest to the type of person Caleb Williams is off the field? Again, on the field, there's no doubt about his talents. I mean, his throws are, are you know, he's he's got wild moments in every single tape that I've that I've, I've broken down here. So off the football field, what kind of person, if you can fill us in, is Caleb Williams, and does he love football? I definitely characterize him as a, a wee guy. And I think this year in particular, he's really gone out of his way to, to show that. And I think it's been in a genuine way. It's not like, hey, I'm going to be a first round pick. I need to go show everyone I'm a wee guy when I'm really not. I, I think he is genuinely that way. And he, he's really tried to put his best foot forward. And I think he's done that. So he's beloved by his teammates. I remember at the end of the season, last year's USC center, Justin Dietrich, we just asked what it meant for him to play with Caleb Williams. And he went on this long rant about how great of a teammate Caleb was and how he, he really is beloved by his teammates. I got to cover an event at a boys and girls club out here where Caleb Williams played football and, and threw the ball around with some kids. And he went out of his way to get everyone's name and made sure everyone was having fun. So I, I think sometimes the, the like diva sort of reputation that he has, a lot of that comes from stuff that, wasn't said by him. For example, the whole thing with his dad and his camp, maybe wanting a stake in an NFL team. Do I doubt that those conversations happen behind the scenes? I I think in this era of player empowerment, maybe, or or not, maybe, I think it's a good idea to have those conversations if you're a potential number one overall pick, but what did his actions show about him being a diva? Yes, they might've talked about that, but he never asked for that. He never went out of his way and said, I'm not going to this team unless I get a per percentage of, of ownership. So I think sometimes you, you get that report out there and then it's like, oh, this guy's a bad guy. Look at what's happening right here. When, when maybe it was just a conversation behind the scenes and they never acted on it. So I, I think he's a he's a really good teammate, a, a really good leader. The coaches love him. He, he works really hard too. And to your question about whether he loves football or not, he absolutely does love football. I can say that without a doubt in my mind. I, I don't really think the knocks against him, however small they might be. And we can get into some more legitimate ones than him being a diva are, are in any way, I should say, outweigh his talent and his potential. If I was a general manager who had the number one overall pick, I'd risk my future taking him as well. He's a guy I'd feel comfortable. Hey, if it's a miss, it's a miss, but he checks all the boxes. Right. And, and the, the more stuff that's come out after the, the season, you know, in terms of like, I don't know if this is maybe you can collaborate the story or not, but I heard like, you know, he actually was thinking about playing in, in, the, in the bowl game and then and decided because you know, if, if he had played, then I, I guess a lot of schools were going to a lot of guys were going to transfer to to USC to take a spot. But he wanted to give his backup uh, Moss the, the opportunity to start. And, and and that's why, you know, he was real excited to for, for that backup to go and have that great game in the bowl game. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but this is all stuff that we hear here in Chicago. Maybe you can collaborate that or not. But I, I, again, it just seems like this is a guy that, 
you know, for me, it, it, like I said, town speaks volumes, right? The tape speaks volumes for him. It, just, it was just the off the field stuff. And the more I've, uh, he's opened up, the more we've, we've gotten to see Caleb Williams, the more I, I think is, you know, he's, he's someone that, that, that really is likable and is, gen is a genuine person. And I also heard that he's also really uh, big into charity, uh, you know, in terms of like uh, mental health and all that, that's very important to him as well. Can you collaborate that information? Yeah. Well? So, so, so for the first thing, I, I think that's just a rumor. Caleb Williams, he was not going to play in, in the bowl game. That was decided a long time before maybe he talked to Miller Moss and said, hey, I want to play, but if you play, then you can go on and win the job next season. I, I saw that tweet today. My staff, we've been texting back and forth about that, and based on everything we've heard, that maybe was a little bit of a white lie told from a player to a media person to try to paint Caleb in the right light. I don't think that had anything to do with – with Caleb Williams camp, I think a player might've just misspoke and it was as simple as that. Cause the source of, of that story, Brett, he does a great job. I don't want to say he, he, he's not a, a good reporter or anything like that, but, uh, and just to fill people in, there was a report that Caleb wanted to play in the bowl game, but chose not to, to give USC's backup the best chance to put his best foot forward and win the job. I don't believe that to be true. And the guy who reported it, heard it from another player. Uh, I, I think something kind of got lost in the shuffle there with that, but as to him caring about mental health and, and being a good guy off the field. Absolutely. I mean, he put out an anti-bullying public service announcement when he was at USC because he feels so strongly about that. He's a guy who, this is controversial, paints the nails, and that rubs a lot of people the wrong way. I, I, I think the, the most important, well, not the most important, but a really cool thing about Caleb Williams is that he, he's really unafraid to be himself. And the thing with the nails, like I don't really like him painting a, a swear and then the opponent on his nails. I, I don't really know how that helps him or, or, or why that's the, the best thing for him, but he's unapologetically himself. He won't stand back away from the fact that he does that. He, he doesn't care what other people think. And I think in this day and age, that's really important. And you got to have thick skin if you're going to be the number one overall pick, especially a quarterback. I think he has really, really thick skin. So, so moving on to to on the field with Caleb and, and breaking, like I said, may break down his tape, but broken about five or six of, the, of his games. And and the one thing, obviously, every game you see you know, two or three wild throws, like how the hell did he make that completion? But the one thing that that, that you know I see as that we saw here with Justin Fields, and this could be also this this you know these these athletic quarterbacks that always think they can always buy more time with their athletic ability and, and make plays. There are times where where he just didn't play on rhythm, meaning that you know there was a receiver coming open. For whatever reason, he looked at him, didn't throw, didn't pull the trigger, held the ball, and then thought he could maybe get a, a bigger play down a football field. Do you think that was just him kind of falling into bad habits? What was there a reason why we saw more of that this this year than, than the previous season? Was just just the, the offensive line and, and or the defense being as poor as they were for USC this past year? Was those the, you know part of the reason why we saw some of these bad habits develop with with Caleb this past season? I think so. Once USC got through the cupcake part of their schedule it became pretty clear pretty quick that the defense for USC hadn't taken the step forward people expected. And the USC offensive line was not anywhere near as good as it was the year prior. So I think Caleb Williams in a lot of those bigger games felt like he had to be Superman. And when he would try to, to do a, you know, make a big play when maybe there was an easier option available, we'd see him fumble the ball. And I, I think he had something around 20, fumble some he recovered others he didn't that was a big problem for him trying to do too much and it ended up with him fumbling the football a lot I think that's something that can be coached out of him especially at the NFL level I think the Bears what they've done they've added a good amount of pieces to be a attractive destination for a rookie quarterback where I think last year's USC roster wasn't a good spot for a quarterback to be he didn't have a lot of time because the offensive line wasn't great and the defense was giving up a million points so if you're a quarterback in that situation you have to gamble you have to take chances and that's exactly what Caleb Williams did looking to the Bears his receivers are, are going to be good I think the offensive line will probably be a little bit better than than USC's was we'll have more time and the defense has to be better because USC's defense was pitiful so I, I I think that'll be coached out of them and at the NFL level it, it, you don't have the the time to to do a lot of those crazy plays and we look at Lamar Jackson there are times when he dances out of tackles but then there are other times where he takes these big shots and Caleb Williams I think as he gets his sea legs under him and he gets better gets more reps he'll quickly learn that he's a really good athlete but everyone else at the NFL level is a really good athlete too and I think the mistakes that he made last year trying to do too much that's going to be coached out of him I really believe that 
Tyler, uh, I've got some questions here from the chat that I'd like you to address. Uh, let's see. Jay Grizz uh, asks, how did uh, Brandon Brendan Rice look today? And I'll add to that, uh, how close is that relationship uh, between Caleb Williams and Rice? And the reason I ask, general managers don't often draft a quarterback and a wide receiver from the same school, but it seems like I, I wonder if the Bears knew of – Allen's connection with with Caleb and flew him down there so that they could be together and maybe they're trying to build a, an environment where Caleb can walk in and be very comfortable. So tell us a little bit about Rice and can you uh, foresee? Give me, give us your opinion on whether you know that would be a, something the Bears should consider bringing Rice in for Caleb. I think they should consider it, but I don't look at those two guys as like thickest thieves, best friends. It would be a home run if they both. We're on the same team. It could definitely help, but I, I don't think they're a, a best friend situation. The Keenan Allen move, I, I think, is a stroke of genius. A guy who Caleb clearly knows, respects, a guy who was affordable too. It's not like they broke the bank to bring Ke Keenan Allen in, a fourth round pick. I, I'm a Patriots fan. I wish the New England Patriots did that. I, I thought that was a really smart move. And he's a guy who has a relationship with Caleb. And if Caleb goes there, maybe not if, when, he'll have a guy who he likes and is really talented. As for the USC receivers this past year, Rice was great. He caught the most touchdowns from Caleb. Taj Washington probably had the best connection with Caleb Williams, a slot receiver who will probably go later in the, the fifth or seventh round. I think if you're the Bears, if I was Ryan Poles and I had a pick later in the draft, I'd probably take it on Washington because Rice will go before. Maybe you don't want to use a, a higher draft pick on a, on a guy like him, but maybe take a chance on someone, Taj Washington, who, who has that relationship with Caleb. Chemistry is clearly there and someone who wouldn't be as expensive. I actually love both those receivers. I love Brendan Rice. He's on my top 10 list for receivers. And I love Taj Washington. I saw him at the East West Shrine Pro. And this kid is, what, five, five, seven, five, eight. But he attacks that football with, with an aggression. And, and I would love to see. The Bears are in need of a couple more receivers. So you get Taj Washington that day, day three. Uh, they only have four picks left. So we'll see what, what's going on with, once that's all said and done. But Taj Washington and Brendan Rice, either one of those guys would have a nice, nice fit on the Bears, in my opinion. Yeah, with Washington, too, I just think he is a guy who, if you talk to any USC coach, they'll say this guy was a coach's dream. He did everything right. I, I think he has the chance to have a long career. Uh, Ralph Love wants to know if, uh, with Caleb being just slightly above six feet, uh, do you think that could be a problem for him in the NFL? Never say never, but I don't look at it like, oh, that's the reason he's going to fail. I think it's easier to be a smaller quarterback now than it, it ever has been. The The game, as we know, guys are trying to be faster than, than bigger in a lot of instances, so so that can kind of help there with, with some of his size issues. But I, I think if Kyler Murray can, can – succeed Caleb's a different player but he, he's a smaller guy and Caleb I, I think could can definitely succeed at the league because uh or in or excuse me because of even with his small stature sorry I'm trying to spit that out it's been a long day over here I, I don't think that's gonna be a big issue if I may chime in, I'll do real quick on that. Please. And I'm a proponent of, of, of the prototypical size quarterbacks. I like those those bigger, stronger quarterbacks. Yeah. But with Caleb, it's a little just a little 10 or 6 1. His his ability to find passing windows because of his arm angle, the way he can he can manipulate his arm angle, he can throw from different arm angles, from a three-quarter, from a sidearm. I mean, he made one pass around around Latou from UCLA that I'm like, how do you get the ball around him? And and, and that's the thing I think he does a great job of. Of, of manipulating his arm and going finding passing lanes. So I don't think that's going to be a hindrance for him going into the future. That, that's my opinion. Uh, Jay Grizz just writes, uh, how good was USC center and is he draft eligible? I forgot to pick up you, you guys on your website had a list of everyone that was a, at the pro day. And I forgot to pick up the copy from the copy machine. I could have answered that question myself, but why don't you tell us Connor? No worries. Justin Dietrich. He is draft eligible. He wasn't invited to the draft combine. He was U.S. Uh, guard at USC earlier in his career, switched to center last year, had some bumpy moments. I don't think it was as clean of a transition as you would have hoped, so he doesn't go to the combine, but he is draft eligible. I don't envision him getting drafted. Maybe he'll get a free agent contract somewhere, but to me, I, I don't think he's the center that Bears fans might be looking for. He gave Chicago fans a heart attack today when, when he when he when he wrestled Caleb Williams to the ground. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> I don't know if you, I don't know if you, you had a, a view – 
of, of that little exchange there. Uh, I, I missed the, that, but Justin's a, a funny guy. He's kind of like the, the class clown, clown a little bit, so I, I can see that. Interesting. You said that you're a Patriots fan. Uh, so we were, I was frankly a little surprised that maybe the Patriots would make a move for Justin Fields. What are your thoughts about Justin Fields? And are you surprised that the Patriots, you know, didn't make a, an offer? Looking at the price, I guess a little bit. Why, why not try based on what they've had a quarterback the last few years. I think, though, they want to go in a totally new direction. Jacoby Brissett comes in. He'll be the bridge guy. They'll probably draft someone at three or trade down and draft someone later. Maybe they get a great pick in 2025 and then draft someone that year. I think they're dead set on drafting someone, so that's probably why they didn't do it. But I certainly would have tried because it really couldn't have gotten much worse for them at quarterback based on uh, what happened last season. So yeah. if the price was a lot, I'd say no, but the, it, he was so cheap. I, I, I wish they did. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, can I have a follow up on that one? I'm, I'm surprised they gave up Mac Jones so quickly. I mean, I mean, Mac Jones came in, had a solid rookie year, went to the Pro Bowl. I mean, I mean so they went to the playoffs. Um, and obviously, Belichick makes that weird decision to bring in two, you know, a, a defensive coordinator and then a special teams guy to be an offensive coordinator. And and I think just obviously that that just kind of threw Mac's career off the rails. Why not give him another shot? I mean, wouldn't you rather give him a shot and make him the, the bridge quarterback instead of Jacoby Brissett? I think the belief in New England was. Max's career can get back on track, but it's probably not going to be here. And I think everyone, the new staff, they agreed we we like him, but it's probably not going to happen here. So I think that was the the, the reason. I, I sort of agree, but I, I think Belichick just messed it up so bad with him that even now it, it is a, a new group there. I don't know if the offensive guys really trust him. He just took a big hit last year, losing his job and than not really being a part of the program a little bit. It seemed like once Bailey Zappi came in, he sort of was doing his own thing. I, I think they just needed to cut ties from him. I'll be rooting for him, though. I hope he has a good year. I feel like Bill kind of screwed him up, especially after that rookie season. Mm-hmm. Um, back to Caleb. Uh, a lot of people have talked about this the subject matter of Caleb crying on his mom's shoulder after that loss. You know, personally, I don't see, think it's a big deal. I cry every day. And sometimes, you know, after a bear's loss, I do it right here on camera. Um, but uh, what what is your interpretation of what happened there? And what can you share with our fans? You know, to, again, to me, it doesn't seem like a big deal. But uh, tell us what you witnessed and what you've heard about that. So that was after the Washington game where USC, the offense, played really well. Caleb did lose a fumble, but – Besides that, that was a high-scoring game, and USC's defense just did not get any stops. So I think that was just a culmination of a, a season gone wrong, frustration, sadness, all that, and it gets caught on camera, and a lot of people don't like that. And I listen to Boston Sports Radio every day, and a lot of my favorite people on there had a big problem with it. I think it's a situation where, of course, it doesn't look good if you – see a guy crying in his mother's arms leads you to think a lot of things, but I guarantee you that when Caleb Williams goes into that bears locker room and the guys get to know him and see what he's about, see how much he cares that the genuine relationships that they're going to develop will far overreach those thoughts that they maybe had when they saw him crying. I, I, I think it's the era we're in where you see something for like five to 30 seconds maybe you don't like, and it kind of sticks with you and you can't get it out of your head. But if you talk to Caleb and you are around Caleb every day, you'll see that, okay, he cried in his mom's arms, but he's a damn good quarterback. He's a damn good leader. And he's going to give Chicago a chance to win a lot of games. So to me, that didn't really rub me the wrong way. The big concern was, oh, if he's going to cry after a loss, how is he going to lead his team? Can you rely on a guy like that? I think the answer is yes. That to me showed how much he cares and how frustrated he was that USC season didn't go the way that a lot of people thought it would. If you don't like that reaction, I, I understand it. It's not a manly reaction. It's not really a, a football reaction that we're used to seeing, but I, I didn't have a big problem with it. I think that's something he can overcome. I don't know if that's something he'll ever do again, but to me, I, I think people have to look past that. If you can't, so be it. I think the Bears will, and they'll be better for it. Uh, you know, I I think he's – got a, a tight relationship with his mom and dad from everything that I've read. And, uh, and I think that's, it, it's pretty cool that he is vulnerable enough to, to uh, display that. I also have a theory that the reason he was crying was because of his offensive line. 
that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I think it speaks to his competitive nature. I mean, I, th yeah. I think I mean I don't I don't take it as as a sign of weakness. I think it's, it's the kid really seems to want to win, and and I think that yeah. kind of really just it was a frustration. And I think I'm not sure if his mom said anything that kind of made him just kind of start crying. But um, I, I just I just think that was a kid that was frustrated, wanted to win, uh, knew that this is the last season in college football, and, and and it wasn't going the way he wanted to go. That's yeah. how I see it too. And I mean, they were number five or six in the AP poll to begin the year and the season that everyone expected it all came crashing down. And that was sort of their last hope to, to do anything. I, I totally get where he was coming from. Do you find that he's the type of guy that wears his emotions on his sleeve? Well, yes and no, because I, I think in the locker room after a game, he'll be really angry if, the, if they lost and we don't really see that. He does a really good job of, when he's addressing reporters after a game of collecting himself and, and he's not the Tim Tebow, we're not going to lose another effing game. Like that's not who he is. He'll, he's more calm, cool, collected. And once he settles down, I, I don't think he wears his emotions, honestly, but in the locker room and at halftime when he's leading his team, is he a lot different? Absolutely. But when talking to us, it's, I, I don't, I wouldn't characterize him that way. Speaking of talking to the media, there were a couple of incidents where he, he refused to talk to the media. Is is that something that was a like a just a one off thing, or is that something he, he would he would do? Because that's not going to fly here in Chicago. So I'm curious how that how he operates post game. I forget if it happened twice or not. So it definitely happened after the the Utah game, and I think I don't want to be in the wrong here, but I believe he left and. and USC administrators didn't know that he'd left yet. And if he wasn't going to talk, then they didn't want anyone to talk. So then only Lincoln Riley spoke and I'm a reporter. I like it when the guys talk after a game, but I don't want to be the guy who's like, he owes it, you know, to, to me to talk. I, I felt like he probably owed it to the fans to, to say something after a frustrating loss. And he didn't, I don't think that was the best look. I think it's another example of a thing that it's not the end of the world. And I wouldn't, not take him number one now because he didn't talk to reporters after one game. But I didn't think that was a good look at all because win or lose at a young age, you're taught you, you got to show up and, and, and you got to, no matter what happens after a win, after a loss, you, you got to do the same thing after a game. And if you're the quarterback, that's talking to reporters. So I think that was his mistake. If we asked him today how he feels about it, I wonder if he'd say, I, I messed up. I'm not sure, but I didn't think that was a great look for him. No. Connor, before we release you, I'd love to know, as a Notre Dame fan, what the USC team looks like for 2024. Well, believe it or not, right now we just did a podcast. I feel better about their defense than their offense. Funny enough, their offense, there's just a lot of question marks. It's a new quarterback. It's a new running back. It's a new group of receivers. It's a new left tackle, a new right tackle, a center who's switched from left tackle, a bunch of new tight ends. So they have a lot of question marks on offense. But they got Lincoln Riley, so when you have him, your offense will always be pretty good. Defensively, I like a lot of the moves they made with their staff. I don't know if they'll be a great defense, but I think they have the potential to be a pretty good defense, which will be a lot different from the USC teams that we've seen here in the past. So I, I don't think they're going to be a college football playoff team. I, I think they should be tough to beat. But overall, a lot of question marks right now. I, I think they're over under is seven and a half for, for the year. So can they get to eight wins? Maybe. I don't know if they're going to be a great, great team, but they should be good. And then I think in 2025, that's the year you got to watch out for USC. I expect them to be a lot better in two years. Excellent. Danny, you got anything else for Connor? Yeah, we, we kind of touched on, obviously, Caleb and, and Brendan Rice and, and Taj Washington. Are there any other um, draft eligible or notable players from, from the SC squad that, that you know, Bears fans or you know, our listeners should, should you know, keep an eye out for? I think the guy who will go after Caleb Williams – First will be Marshawn Lloyd, the running back. He is an animal. He had some fumble issues, but that was really the only problem he had. He averaged seven yards a carry at, at USC last year, which was, I think, six in the country. So he's just a beast of a runner. He told me today he's meeting with the Tennessee Titans tonight. So if the Titans get him, so be it. But I think any team would be lucky to have him. He's a guy who you throw right in, and he's big, he's strong, he's physical. He'll be ready to compete right away. And then Kalen Bullock is a safety who – if he had a really good year this past season, could have potentially been a first-round pick. I think now he's probably more of a, I, I think, third or fourth-round pick, and some teams like him as a cornerback. But he has a lot of talent, a lot of intangibles, really fast, great ball hawk. 
He's a guy who I think could have a long career as well, although his stock slipped a little bit based off a disappointing season this past year. Connor, uh, tell us where our followers can find your work and promote away. Thank you. Yes, yeah, C underscore Morris said on Twitter, as you see on the graphic, and then uscfootball.com. We'll have a bunch of Caleb Williams stuff on there from now until the draft, and I'll be watching them closely in Chicago. I know that's for sure, so I'm looking forward to it. Please make sure you tell Ryan Abraham that he was absolutely right when he uh, said that you'd be a great interview and uh, you, you know your stuff. Thank you very much, Connor. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. No, yeah, thank you. Take care. Appreciate it. All right, Danny. Um, that, was, that, was a good, that was a good low down breakdown of, of, of today's events. So, yeah. Really, really good. Yeah. I forgot he, to ask him, I'm assuming he lives out in Southern California. Yes. Yes. Uh, and only the Patriots fan, like Patriots fan out in Southern California. I, I thought the same thing because they do, uh, you know, at least one show a week and maybe two. And so he's out there, but I, I'm pretty sure he's, I mean, he wasn't at uh, California today. So I'm pretty sure he, that's where he lives. Um, but why don't we take a quick 40 second break, Danny? And then when we come back, we'll talk about Caleb. What your thoughts on his pro day? We'll get your scouting report on him, and we'll look at the ten quarterbacks. And of course, we'll end the show talking Justin Fields because I got a lot of, I got a feeling that right now that is the most, still the most divisive topic in football. So I want to deal with the flamethrowers at the end of the show, not in the middle of the show. All right, sounds good. All right, we'll be right back, everyone. I'd be surprised, I think, if it just not because I've heard something, but it just feels like a Caleb Williams, Roma Dunze pairing is going to happen um, in Chicago. That feels like it's still going to happen even after Keenan Allen, DJ Moore. You know, Keenan's better in the slot. I think Rome's an outside guy. I know him and Caleb have talked quite a bit. So if Caleb's going to be the first overall pick, which I feel confident he will be, I think Rome makes a lot of sense for the Bears as well, too. Uh, I, I, I think I don't see how he makes it to nine, though. That's the only thing. I think he'll, I think he'll, it'll be close. It'll be close for sure. I think he'll get there um, unless someone trades up to the Falcon spot, which the Falcons have talked to teams about moving down in the draft a little bit. We are back here at the uh, bar room headquarters. Uh, that's Danny Shimon. I'm Aldo Gandhi. We're going to talk about Caleb Williams pro day today. Danny, did you get to see most of it? I know you were at the office doing some work, but did you see any of it? Can you comment on what you saw? No, I, I watched, I watched the whole thing. And, and um, like I was talking to, uh, to our guests earlier, it's, it's, it, Pro days really are, are I mean, the, the, for people who are not like Caleb Williams or like the the running backs, the, the defensive line, offensive linemen, like some guys that want to show off some stuff that they, they they kind of didn't show, they didn't feel like they didn't do well at, at the combine in terms of testing. You know, those guys can take advantage of it. But Caleb Williams really, the, the throwing session for quarterbacks really doesn't do much for me. I mean, like, like, like you know, our guest said, like, you go and watch the tape and you put on his tape and, you know, the throwing the football is is not is not the issue with Caleb Williams, right? They're like, you know, talk about like we talked about this off the field stuff, you know, all the stuff that you heard I heard prior to this the season beginning. Uh, but again, like I said to to Connor, like the more you hear him talk, I understand he's he's being coached up and, and he knows he's on TV. But I mean, it just feels like it's genuine. It feels like this is a guy that that you know is is a little misunderstood. Um, you know, Southern California, Hollywood kind of kind of hype around him. And I think um, you know the most important thing is is we you know what the Bears find into, when they dive into his his background. So for me, the the overall the uh, the whole hype around the the uh, the pro day really didn't do much for me. I know the kick and throw. Uh, I know that they were doing some more structured stuff in terms of you know you know, five step, three step, seven step drops, as opposed to some of those rollout crazy throws that we see on typical pro days, because you see those rollout crazy throws on his tape. So you want to see this, this, this opposite. You want to see, well, you know, other guys like Zach Wilson and all these guys, you know, they wow people with, with some of these, you know, crazy throws in the pro days. Well, Caleb, you just want to see the basic stuff. You want to see, you know, him getting the ball out to, to the running back in the flats. You want to see him, you know, three step drop, get rid of the football, you know, stuff like that. And, and I think, you know, he's got plenty of arm strength he's a, in terms of talent. You know, he's, he's a talented thrower of the football. You know, I'll, I'll dig into that in his scouting report later on. But nothing really, you know, uh, stuck out to me in terms of what I wanted to see other than just, you know, I want to see in his interaction with his teammates. 
you know, how was that, uh, you know, uh, with, with other teams? Obviously, I, I, I thought, I think I saw him interact with with the, the commanders. Uh, I think Dan Quinn and, and Adam Peters, their general manager, both kind of dab, dabbed them up. And obviously we saw, you know, Ryan Poles and Eber Flus and, and um, the quarterback coach for the Bears also out there as well talking to them. So, uh, you know, I, I think I think those are the, the two teams he's, he's probably going to go and visit. I don't think he's going to go visit anybody else. And um, we'll see how it goes. But, I mean, everything right now points to Keel Williams coming to Chicago unless something unforeseen happens or something is discovered that we don't know about. Mac Dad, he says, did you also see how he kept overthrowing his uncovered receiver with nobody rushing him? I I, I don't think he That's really good. did much of that. He himself said he overthrew two guys, uh, but for the most part, he was on target. It's all so scripted, you know. It, it, that was probably the most unimpressive thing that it just looked like a rehearsal of some of a play that they've been working on for a long time. Right. So for me, like the throwing session at the combine is mm -hmm. something I take more notice of because you are not in your elements. You're a little uncomfortable. You're working with receivers you haven't worked with before. You know, these are these are throws. These are to your to your guys. You should be able to, you know, hit these guys. Yep. And like I said, other than that, that uh, one or one or two throws. I mean, I, I didn't see anything, you know, um, errant. I mean, he threw the last one to uh, Brennan Rice, which I think covered about 50, 60 yards in, in, in the air and, you know, hit him in stride. I think this might be right here. Now, now the ball is a little wobbly at the end. If you want to be a little nitpicky, but he hit hit uh, Brendan Rice in stride, um, you know, for for a, for a big gainer there. So um, again, you know, the combine throwing session to me is I take a little bit more more stock on those uh, because again, you're uncomfortable. You're you're just kind of throwing with these receivers and like see how how it operate there. But these are just kind of all like I said, rehearsed, practiced. Your guys, you should you should look good. So uh, for me, it was the more the more important thing was his interaction and just kind of him talking to the media and his teammates and then you know the teams he was he was talking to after after the play. I remember last I remember last year where we had the uh, the Bryce uh, Young uh, his his out there he was talking to um, mm -hmm. was it uh, Josh McCown and, and talking Josh about McCown. you yeah. know talking about now see you later or something like that or, or was it was it with the uh, CJ Stroud we're talking about it was words. it was with CJ Stroud and McCown says I'll see you in Carolina. And yeah. Stroud turned to uh, some of his partners and said, do you hear that? He was so excited because it made it seem like they were going to pick him number one in the draft. And, and they didn't. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, nothing, nothing, nothing really stuck out to me. Uh, very good. Now, a lot of people in the chat have asked about the meeting with the Chicago Bears. Caleb was asked about that at his, uh, the scrum that uh, Connor was at. This was his response as to how it went. He he was asked specifically, "What did you learn from the Chicago Bears?" Yeah, it was great. Um, I don't think I really need to learn much. Just building a relationship. Um, they're trying to see if I'm the right fit um, to be first pick as a QB and, and go and possibly as a face of franchise. Um, they're trying to um, you know figure out if this is the guy that they should invest all the time, energy, effort, and money into, uh, which is obviously important in, in this situation. So. Um, you know, it was, it was great. Um, and, and just, you know, building relationships, yeah. building a relationship, Danny, that's what, where this is at right now. And, uh, yeah. Uh, Brad Biggs is reporting that the Bears had their meeting with Caleb already, and all that needs to be scheduled is his physical, which will probably take uh, place at uh, um, at Hallis Hall. But if they're only allowed 30 visits, Danny, maybe they do the physical in Los Angeles or someplace outside of Hallis Hall. Maybe they, they, they did it already or, or, or will do it before they leave. Uh, that might be a violation. I'm not quite sure. But in any case, Brad Biggs is reporting that the meeting is done and they're just still waiting the physical. What do you think? You still want to bring him into your building. You know, even though you've, you've met him, you've, you, you think you're, you feel good about him. Yeah, uh, you know, the, the medical is, is not just a, like you and I go and we draw blood and hey, 10, 15 minutes later, we're all back home. No, the, the medical for NFL player, I mean, they're poked and prodded, they're tested, their joints, their ligaments blood work, everything. I mean, it's, it's a, it's an ordeal. That's a lot of why these guys don't like doing it at the combine because, you know, they get up early in the morning, got four, you know, four o'clock in the morning and they run through this whole gamut of tests. And at the combine, it's all 32 doctors, all 32 teams poking mm -hmm. and parting at you. And now you have to go and perform on the field. Right. So that's why a lot of players don't like doing that. That's one of the reasons probably why Caleb 
one of, the, one of many reasons why Caleb didn't want to do it. So no, I think you still bring him in just so that he can now meet the PR people, the, the people in the front office. You know, I, I, don't, I didn't see Kevin Warren out there today, so I'm not sure if Kevin Warren was out there in, 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 in uh, California meeting him. So you want the president of, of the, you know, uh, of the, of the team, you know, George McCaskey, Virginia McCaskey to all meet him, uh, you know, cause do you want him to, when they want, when he gets drafted and he steps into the building to feel comfortable, to not, you know, be, to not, not have someone in the building that he hasn't know or hasn't already met. So I think that that's the importance there. But yeah, I mean, I, I mean, other than something crazy comes out in the medical, uh, I, I think it's, it's signed, sealed, delivered in terms of Caleb come, coming to Chicago. Now there were talks about maybe Jaden Daniels could vie, but just, just watching the tapes and going through, you know, going through a, a, doing a deep dive on all these quarterbacks, it's, it's hard to, to bypass on, on a guy that, that the entire league has a has set up as high as as he has and and there's a a, a gap right Jane Downs is kind of closing the gap since the end of the season but still there, there's a gap and uh I, I think I think uh I think I think that, that's why it's gonna go I think it's gonna be Caleb Williams and uh he'll be he'll be the first pick by the Bears and Mac Daddy is uh, expressing some healthy skepticism he says I saw how Notre Dame put pressure on him and he threw three intercessions and got sacked six times and I think Danny you will agree with this is that he's such a super competitor and he tries to be Superman. And that's a, a lot of what happened at that Notre Dame game. It, 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 you know, Notre Dame was a better club than USC, of course, but they weren't that better. You know, this was just one of those games that got out of hand. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, they, they rattled him. Uh, Notre Dame's defense rattled him. And that, that's the one game with, you know, with, with Caleb, you know, when watching his, his games is it's, it's not, he's not a guy that gets rattled easily from what I could tell. Uh, again, I watch about six or seven of his games, so I haven't seen you know his whole career. But it just it looks like he's a guy who's confident. He's he's got that swagger about him that you want in your in your quarterback. But the Notre Dame looked like he was rattled. I mean, it looked like he was throwing it into triple coverage at times. I'm not sure, you know, and, and that's the game where we saw the bad the bad body language that I had that I've had I've been kind of warned about at the beginning of the season. We saw him kind of slumping on the bench. Uh, I, I believe an assistant coach came and talked to him. He kind of pushed her, you know, pushed her hand aside or something like that. I think that that was. You know it, whether that's competitive juices, whether that just you know I know I know he's got a thing with Notre Dame, obviously the, the year before you know with with the fingernails. I don't know if there's anything going on just competitively, he just kind of lost it there. But they, I mean he was rattled in that game. So you know no, there's no perfect prospect, there's no perfect player that's coming into the you know this is all a learning process. All you gotta do is just take take their athletic ability, take their their positives, and and hopefully they'll you know those outweigh their negatives. And I think he needs to be coached up. He is not. You know that every everyone's tossing the term generational talent. You know, I said let, let's slow down. I hate that term. I don't like putting that on on these prospects. He's a good prospect, and of, of the of the quarterbacks, he is my top rated quarterback. Surprise, surprise. So I think he's a guy that that's going to come in. He's not flawless. You know, he's got he's got some some marks on him that you have to coach up, and that's the one thing that I'm curious to see with with Shane Waldron and, and some of these these new you know, offensive you know coaches of the breast Barton. Can they coach some of these bad habits out of him and, and get him out and playing, you know, playing well from, from week one? Good stuff. Uh, let's see. I think we've uh, covered our questions there. Why don't we get now to your – actually, there's some more questions, uh, folks. So I we will address them after Danny's top ten. We're going to go through his top ten quarterbacks, and we're going to start with number ten and work our way up to number one. And like Danny said, surprise, surprise, you, you already know who's number one. Now, uh, Danny, the way – Right. The way I did the graphics was going one through 10. So if I show you number 10 on your graphic, we're going to expose the other nine players. Are you okay with that? Or should I just, or should we just say number 10 is Devin Leary? No, you can go anyway. And I can, I can just dive in. I mean, obviously everyone knows who number one is going to be. So, yep. so for number 10 is, 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 uh, is Devin Leary from, from Kentucky. Yeah, this is a kid that, that started at, at, at uh, NC state, uh, played four seasons at NC state transferred to, to Kentucky, uh, this past season, you know, he's played 43 games, 39 starts, and you know has nine career games with at least four, you know, passing touchdowns. As 11 career games with at least 300 yards passing in his game. So, you know, what he has is he's got a the positive for me with with Devin Larry. You know, he's he's at 6'1", 215. He's got a live arm. He can make NFL type throws. He can drill those back shoulder throws that we see that that become real really popular in the NFL. Uh, can adjust his arm and throwing platforms and release it under duress. Um, you know, some of the stuff that that kind of turns, you know, make, makes him a number, you know, number 10 on my list is, you know, average overall size. I said 6'1", 215, 
you know, has already had, you know, two season ending injuries, right? In 2020, suffered a season ending injury. And in 2022, suffered another season injury after six games tore, tore his pec. Um, you know, so sporadic accuracy is also an issue with them. You know, you, you see him struggle um, you know, hurting, hitting receivers in stride. You know, more of a what I call a see it and throw it type of quarterback rather than one that's got some anticipatory uh, skills to be able to kind of feel where the receiver is going and, and kind of, like I said, throw him away from coverage. Um, and again, decision making for me was was a little up and down at Kentucky, but the kid is talented. He's got, like I said, a live arm. Uh, he's a guy that, that you know, worst case scenario is probably like, you know, like a career backup. So so that's why, you know, at, at, at this point, he's number 10 on my list. Excellent. And so at number nine, you've got the kid from FSU, Jordan Travis, who had a uh, fairly serious injury, and that hurt his draft stock. I'm sure you're going to discuss that. Go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. and this is a guy I was talking about throughout the season. This is one of the guys I love to watch play, and he's a guy started off at Louisville in 2018, transferred to Florida State in 2019, uh, four-year starter, uh, has 46 career starts. So we talked about, you know, this has become the rage now is, is these guys with these, this experience with 30 plus starts and he's got 46 starts you know only player at, at florida state to ever rush for seven touchdowns in four straight seasons so it gives you some of that dual threat ability there as well and he was a, you know the 2023 acc player there he was a lone reason why you know, fsu did not make the the college football playoffs because his injury like you said november 18 he fractured fractured his leg it was a, it was a pretty gruesome injury uh that knocked him off for the season that pretty much knocked out uh florida state chances to 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 compete even though they went undefeated the regular season so talk about some of his positives some of jordan's positives are you know his athletic kid dual threat quarterback you know solid arm strength doesn't have the, the biggest arm in the world Elusive and, and slick in a pocket. He can he can elude pressure and escape out that back door. Uh, tough competitor. You know, will stand in there and, and, and take a hit and keep on battling. Uh, some of the, the stuff that that kind of worries me about him. Obviously, size isn't the greatest. Six one two hundred, only nine inch hand size. That's typically on the on the on the smaller scale for for NFL quarterbacks. You know, accuracy downfield can wane at times. Uh, you know, play speed in his head needs to speed up and and be on a consistent basis. Um, you know, there's a lot of times you, you see him holding on to the football, not getting rid of it on time. He, he takes a sack or or the, the ball gets jarred out and then and, and it's an incompletion or, or whatnot. So, um, you know, the, he's got some positives there. The athletic ability, like I said, the dual threat where you can bring him in. This is a guy you can kind of bring in and maybe stash on a, on a practice squad or maybe he's your third string quarterback and just kind of groom him. Now, again, he's he is a sixth year player. Uh, so he's a little up there range. I think he's about 24 or 25. I'm not sure his exact age right now. But again, a guy that can come in here and maybe hopefully develop into a, a you know a decent you know backup at, at worst case scenario. All right. And then at number eight, you got the kid out of Tulane who grew up in Boca Raton. Uh, and uh, he's got great size, six foot threes. Tell us about Michael Pratt, your number eight. Yeah, Michael Pratt is, and if you guys watched last year's USC game versus Tulane, Michael Pratt was the guy who helped lead that charge against USC and help help them beat uh, Caleb Williams. Uh, so you talk about size, six two and a half, you know, uh, two hundred seventeen pounds, a four year starter for Tulane, started forty six games. Again, we're talking about some of that experience here. Uh, Ninety career touchdown passes, set a school record for Tulane. Team captain, so he's he's got that leadership experience. Um, and again. A leader, experienced starter, pocket passer, some of the positives I like about him, and with the ability to use his feet to go ahead and, and break away from pressure. He's got 28 career rushing touchdowns. So not I wouldn't call him a dual threat quarterback, but he has the ability to use his legs to be a threat with his with his feet. Um, can feather the ball with with touch in between the second and third levels of a defense. So he's got some throwing ability. Uh, he shows some some touch there as well. Disappointed me really at, at the senior ball practices, really looked off off kilter there. Accuracy was all over the place. I, I really took took a um, it was a little bit of a, of a downer for me watching him play at, at the Senior Bowl. Uh, doesn't possess the uh, the strongest arm, so he's some of his negatives. Doesn't have the strongest arm uh, in, you know, in the world. You know, more of a another one of those see it and throw it kind of quarterbacks. You know, you want these quarterbacks to have the the feel, the the anticipatory reaction, be able to kind of throw it to a spot, throw his receiver away from away from coverage. Doesn't have that. Doesn't at least doesn't show that on his tape consistently um an accurate deep ball you know there's a lot of times as receivers downfield to stop and adjust and, and work to make the catch so you know some of the things that that i saw on tape that really kind of knocked them down for me and again that that senior bowl really kind of turned me off in terms of of him it just shows that he's got a he's got some more ways to go and some more some more work to do but definitely a guy that, that could be you know, like a, a stick on a roster, in, you know next year and, and, and be a, a quality backup down the road might eventually 
challenge for a job. But, but right now, I think I just see him as a, as a solid backup. All right, at number seven out of South Carolina, he was actually at Oklahoma and played football alongside of Caleb Williams. I did a, a little thing on our Bear Their Soul show where I showed uh, highlights from that spectacular comeback victory against Texas that uh, Oklahoma had, uh, and Spencer Rattler kind of uh, paved the way for Caleb to be a big star by making a couple of mistakes. Take yeah. it away, Danny. You got it. Uh, a four-year call starter between Oklahoma and 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 uh, and South Carolina. He's got he's got 48 games of experience, 42 starts. You talked about it. He was a national freshman of the year in 2019. He was a first-team All Pac-12, all, all Big 12. Sorry. And then halfway through his sophomore season, here comes Caleb Williams, and he, and he replaces him. And and then you know he didn't really get to the bench. Um, then transferred to to uh, uh, South Carolina in 2022. And I think he did well for himself. I think he bounced back nicely, right? Uh, you know, a two-time team captain for South Carolina. Uh, and this is a guy I talked about, Michael Pratt, maybe kind of having a bad week at, at the Senior Bowl. This kid, the more I've seen him in person, whether it's at the Senior Bowl practices in the game or at, at the Combine, I think I've, I've liked him more and more. I think some teams agree. I think he's gone himself, worked himself into that middle tier of that of, of the draft. So I'm in maybe like fourth, you know, third, fourth round range right now. But again, compact, clean motion. You know, throws a, a soft, catchable football, solid touch and accuracy. You know, displays mobility and movement skills in the pocket. You know, has had a nice. You know, again, talked about the Senior Bowl and and the the Combine week. I think those really help boost his stocks. You know, a, a lot of this of the the coaching staff now just for seeing some of these. Some of these players, you know, live at the Senior Bowl and at, at the Combine, saw some of his his ability in terms of the way he spins that football, the way he throws it with with a nice compact motion and ease, and and it pretty you know pretty accurate. I think that that kind of you know bumped him up his stock in terms of in, at least in, amongst the coaches' eyes. Now, some of the negatives on Spencer, obviously undersized, only six feet, you know, two two hundred eleven pounds, you know, average arm strength, doesn't have that that big howitzer, if you will. Uh, to get it, you know, deep down the field, you know, does not generate, you know, the velocity on and on the move, and and a deep ball can come up short. Um, you know, can be too jittery versus pressure, and, and quick to kind of tuck it or run or just heave it up. You know, I was watching, you know, his his receiver Xavier um, uh, Leggett, and a lot of times where you know Leggett had had the guy beat, and just rather was just a little bit off, and just you know overthrew him or underthrew him, and just wasn't always on target. So I think uh, you know watching that. Kind of you know set me up for for a, a little bit of a uh, an idea in terms of what to expect, but then again watching him at the Senior Bowl and watching him throw at at the Combine, that kind of you know not only opened my eyes but also I think like I said earlier uh, opened up a lot of co coaches' eyes and I think he's gonna see himself now in that fourth round range probably you know summer early day three. You're on mute, my friend. Man, that five dollars on the kitty. Um. Getting back to uh, Jordan Travis, uh, Cliff asked a question here. I, I want to try to get it in right now. He says that if if Travis doesn't get hurt, do you think that uh, Florida State uh, is uh, in the tournament and the Final Four of college yes. football? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we'll never know. <laughs> okay, back to the list at number six. You've got a guy who I am. I mean, this guy's name is catching fire. I see, you know, uh, Daniel Jeremiah, uh, Mel Kuyper, putting him in the first round. It's Bo Nix. What do you think? Yeah, and and in Bo Nix, another guy. We're we'll talking about experience, right? This guy has been, has been a you know a, a high, he was a highly recruited you know four star prospect to come out of high school. He's been a five year starter, guys. This is guy, you know, went to Auburn, right? His dad played at Auburn, so there was a little bit of a, you know, a, a, a you know, bloodline there. Uh, it, it was a starter as a freshman, right? And when I saw him as a freshman, I'm like, oh, this guy looks good. This guy's got some some moxie to him. He's got an athletic ability. He's got a good solid build, good guys all frame, and it just it was downhill from there. And you know, three years at, at Auburn. By the time he left Auburn, he looked like a deer in headlights in terms of. And Gus Monzon was his, was his coach, and I think a lot of times the, the offense just looked cluttery and, and bad, and he looked confused. Lo and behold, transfer to Oregon, and it just really just, for my opinion, just turns turns on turns your know, whole career around, right? You go to Oregon, you put on his tape, and it's a whole different type of quarterback, right? This guy has got 61 career starts, which is the most starts in in the FBS or in college football history. So he's got I talked about the experience, you know, good size, athletic. Dual threat quarterback. He's got 113 passing touchdowns for his career, along with 38 rushing touchdowns for a career. So he's this is guy, as a guy who's mobile, will give you some of that dual threat action. 
quick processor. The guy gets the ball out quickly, you know, has a quick trigger, good wrist snap that translates to a sm smooth throwing motion and a clean, compact delivery. Good you know, athletic ability to be able to slide in the pocket, buy some time with his feet while looking downfield to, to see a, a receiver come open. Good anticipation. Will throw receivers open. Will throw it to a spot and allow his man to beat his coverage and, and get to the ball and make the catch. Uh, can change ball speeds and drop it into the bucket. You know, does not go for what I call big play hunting, right? You know, he's a guy who, who will dump the ball off. He'll take what the defense gives him and, have, and will have no qualms about it. Um, tough minded, you know, highly competitive, uh, vocal leader. Uh, again, a guy with five years worth of starting experience. I think this guy has really shown well and resurrected his collegiate career going in, in, and playing at Oregon. Some of the downsides for, for Bonex obviously works out of the offense that utilizes the shotgun. So he, it, I didn't see any, uh, any snaps on her center. So that's going to be something he's gonna have to work on. Um, you know, footwork will need to, you know, get adjusted. Uh, in terms of when he gets under center at the next level, um, you know, does not always feel the pressure in the pocket. Uh, will stare down primary targets in, in certain moments. Uh, does not rip the, the deep out or drive the ball with hard, high RPMs. So his his arm strength is is slightly above average. It doesn't have a great arm. Uh, can make all the throws, but still, that doesn't have that that high you know high RPM kind of um, speed on on his on his fastball there. Undershoots or, or can hang the deep ball. Right. You see some of that on his tape as well. You know, makes receivers work for that deep ball downfield. Again, we talked about some of that arm strength. Some of those balls tend to flutter. Uh, there's other times where it's it's a nice, you know, easy, easy, smooth, you know, delivery right into the receiver's arm. So that consistency, it's got to be there on, on his deep ball. He's got to work on that. Um, you know, makes a lot of simple one read, you know, one look reads. Uh, you know, the, he's not really challenged uh, by the, by the complexity of the system he was at at Oregon. So, you know, how is that going to go ahead and translate at the next level when, when he's going to get into some of these more pro style forms and so on? So, so there's going to be a little bit of an adjustment period for him. As and we saw some of that at, at the Senior Bowl too. A lot of guy, another guy who struggled with accuracy. You know, getting the ball off in time. You know, a couple of times he get the ball better back in his face. So that's something that he's going to have to adjust to and get coached up at. But I'm watching this guy play. And, and you mentioned, although, you know, you see him in the first round now, this guy to me is made for Sean Payton, right? He's got a little bit of that Drew Brees in him. He's a little sneaky, athletic, quick release, not as accurate as Drew is or was. Maybe he could build to that. But this has Drew Brees or Sean Payton, I should say, written all over it. And I know they have the 12th pick in the draft. That's a bit too high for my, for my blood, but they have no second round pick. So, and, you know, unless they trade down and maybe and get them later on, you know, if the Broncos are there at 12, they need a quarterback. And I think this could be a guy that, in my opinion, is tailor-made for Sean Payne. Oh, we'll keep an eye on that. You heard it here first from Danny Shimon. All right, at number five, the lefty, I told you months ago, keep an eye on Michael Penix. And you watched some tape, you said, Dude, <laughs> you, yeah. you started, if you're starting to learn how to evaluate quarterbacks, I was like, thank you. I, I finally went from master. You know, you finally gave me all, gave me all your all your tips and, and tricks there. But, but yeah, <laughs> you know, Michael Penix, again, another guy, you know, sixth year, you know, football player, uh, started his, his career at, at Indiana, right, uh, from uh, from 2018 to 2021, was 12 and five as a starter there in Indiana, was a team captain in 2020, 2021. Unfortunately, all four seasons ended with an injury, right? He has two torn ACLs. He had two separated shoulders. So, I mean, all those injuries, are the, the red flags are all over the place in terms of medical. Now, the good news is he, he, went, he went to the combine, and the reports are he passed all the medicals. And there are no red flags, and, and everything looks good medically, right? So now when you go and you, you put on his tape, and obviously I, I've seen him a lot. I've seen him. Not just because you recommended him, but I also have seen him because I've you know watched the receivers they have there, Washington, whether it's Odunze or, or Polk or or McMillan, and and you watch him throw it, and you know I like the size, huge hands, can grip it and rip it, tight spiral, uh, strong, accurate arm, can fit it into closing windows with accuracy. We saw some of that in that college playoff game against Texas. Uh, very good quickness on his release. You know, he's got that quick wrist flicking action. You know, the ball just kind of explodes out of his hand, throws it with timing and anticipation, especially on those intermediate routes, throws a pretty deep ball, displaying nice downfield touch. You know, while now he's, he's not a runner, he's got what I call solid foot agility, where he can maneuver and manipulate and, and buy some extra time in the pocket to get his, get his guys, give him guys some time downfield to get open. So those are his positives. Obviously the negatives, you got to start off with the injuries, right? This is a guy has not, you know, has had really, um, you know, some, some really bad injuries in, in his career. 
Um, it's got a tight, stiff lower half. You know, his, his throwing motion is all arm. He's, he's more like he slings it with his arm. It's, it, you see very little in terms of him generating any sort of power or torque with his lower half. So that's something he's going to we're gonna have to work on is his throwing motion. Uh, ball is always on a rope. You know, he's got to have to learn to throw that curve ball, basically meaning he's going to be able to have to drop it off, drop it in between, you know, th that line, that second level linebacker and that third level, you know, a safety or cornerback. So he's got to take something off that ball and be able to drop it, in, you know, level it or feather it if you want to call it. Um, you know, there's a, a pressure can uh, throw off his rhythm and his timing. You know, we'll bail backwards. You'll, you'll see a lot of off, you know, his back foot kind of throws. The ball will sail. You yep. saw a lot of that like versus Michigan. You know, Michigan just got to him. And once they got to him, his rhythm was off. And, and the next thing you know, he was he was just throwing the ball over the place and falling back and, and taking deep shots. So, you know, that's something that, that you need to keep in mind with this kid, which goes to my next point is you need an offensive line for this guy. You need to protect him. He's not a guy that's going to be able to go back there and buy, you know, at, at the NFL level, at least buy some time, run around and, and, and like a Caleb Williams or, or a Jane Daniels and get, get him, you know, get himself, open, you know, get wait for guys to get open. He's an offensive line, but if you protect them, you give them time, whether it's a three-step drop, a five-step drop, this hit's got the, the, the ability to get that ball to, to the receiver on time with accuracy and he can whip it there. So he's got talent you can work with. It's not, he's it needs some refining, but you know, it, the medicals are, are a big, big red thing, but they they all came back clear. Hopefully, he can stay healthy going going on moving to the future. The last two years at Washington, he's been healthy. So you know, if that continues at the next level, this is a kid that, that you could maybe get. Maybe I have a second round grade on him, uh, but I would I wouldn't be shocked if someone jumps in the bottom of that first round and takes him right uh, because mm -hmm. he's got that 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 talented arm and the accuracy and, and the ability to go ahead and make play. And he's tough. He's come back from four season-ending injuries. Two torn ACLs, two separated shoulders, and he's back here and he, and he continues to play. I believe he turns 26 or 25 this, this coming season, so the, the age could be an issue there for some teams. Some teams don't care. Some, I, some teams I've talked to, some scouts, I, that doesn't make a difference. Some of these guys don't even get to their second contract, so let, let's make sure they get to their second contract before you worry about the age, right? Quarterbacks are now playing longer into their careers, so that age thing is no longer an issue anymore. So talented kid, motion is funky, uh, but arm is accurate, arm is strong. Uh, and, and um, I, you know, gamer, and I think this guy can can make be one of those second round gems down the road. Be like, how the hell did this guy lasted a second round? That's how Michael Penix Jr. So, uh, Eagle Bean asked the question, What happened to Penix in that championship game? Uh, yeah, the pressure, like pressure gets him, it rattles him, and he's a, he's a rhythm timing guy. I said, You need an offensive line, you got to protect them, right? If you have a, you have a leaky offensive line. He's probably going to struggle because he needs to get back there, go through his go through his reads, and, and get rid of the football and get those passing lanes. The other thing about him is is he he throws the ball on a rope. So a lot of times, if you're a defender, you get your hands up and you can knock the ball down as well. So, you know, he's a guy you got to protect him, give him time. If you can do that, he's a guy that that can hurt defenses down the football field. All right, uh, next on the list, and Danny, I got to tell you this: I can't believe that I live in an era where a guy like J.J. McCarthy could be drafted on the top half of round one. You know, I grew up in, in uh, football where only sure things are drafted at quarterback in the first round. Not, not that anything's a sure thing, but guys that were considered sure things. To me, J.J. McCarthy offers a lot of questions. You have him at number four. Let's hear your scouting report. And again, we talk about coaches getting involved in this process right now, right? And before I even say that, going back into I've, I've said this multiple times on 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 this show is going back. I believe I was doing a before fifty five, and you and John asked me about the quarterbacks this mm -hmm. year, and I said, JJ McCarthy, the first round. I've been told he's going to be going the first round. Every I think you and John both kind of <laughs> fell off the chairs. I'm like JJ McCarthy. I'm like, yeah. I, yep. Alyssa was happy. Obviously, she's she's a Michigan Michigan fan, yep. but. Right. You know, it, it's he's he's a guy that a lot of scouts like, and now the coaches are, are getting more involved in the scouting process, and they like as well. And his thing is, he's got that what they call it, it factor, the 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 football character that a lot of a lot of people like. And kind of just break him down again. You know, local kid from from Lagrange Park, Illinois, a highly rated highly rated four star high school prospect, two year starter in Michigan. So this guy hasn't really been playing that much. He's he's a, he's a true junior. Uh, a two-year starter, only played in 40 games with 28 starts, but he's a winner. 27 and one record at, at Michigan, an all, an all Big Ten selection uh, in 2022. Uh, so, but McCarthy, when you watch him off, off the hook, I just I would just put him on 
on on a Saturday afternoon, and, and you see you know the way he runs that Michigan offense, and you might say, eh, that's not very impressive. But you break down his tape and you kind of slow down, and you look at the formation, you look at the look what he does, you know, pre and post snap. I can see why coaches are falling in love with him. Okay. Solid size at 6'2, 217, you know, with an athletic frame that still has some more room to get to get bigger, get stronger. Uh, sets up quickly in the pocket, you know, with a wide base stance, uh, clean footwork, quick to set and throw the ball, has a compact over the top motion with a good release and quickness. Um, athletic feet can roll the pocket, evade the rush, or escape when pocket crumbles, displaying good pocket presence and a feel for pressure. You know, the play clock in his head is always on point, right? Seemingly he always, what he wants to do, he's just, he's like a point guard out there. He just wants to get the ball into the hands of his playmakers. He wants to get it out of his hands quickly and into, into his playmakers hands and let them do, do the work. But the play clock is, is what I'm harping on here because He's always on time. He's not a guy that will sit there and hold the ball and hold it and, and try to see a guy come open. Generally, you know, most of the time he's a guy that gets rid of that ball, gets into the hands of his, of his playmaker, and he knows where to go with the football. Good arm talent, releases it quickly, can make, you know, can make the throws, can make all NFL type throws, can fit into tight windows, can alter his uh, platform and throw it on the move or off his back foot. Uh, throws coming out on time and accurately. Uh, drills short to intermediate throws with good timing, touch, and placement. Anticipates where the receiver will be and throws them open. Uh, you know, experience in a pro style system, working under center and shotgun. And then the one thing I noticed with him is he's really good at the play action, guys. He's really good at that. And you know, we we we've harped on this the system that that the Sean McVay, the Shane Waldron, the you know Kevin O'Connell system where they they harp on play action and lo and behold what team is 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 lurking around looking for a quarterback now now has two first round picks the Minnesota Vikings and I think this is could this could be one of the, one of their targets here in JJ McCarthy so that's why I think he's going to go in, in probably in the, in the top six is, is my guess uh, some of the things that that kind of throw me off on on him is, is lacks the ideal size and has relatively small hands for for NFL caliber thrower um, lacks the ball can can be susceptible to big hits um, you know, can be a little bit too cerebral at times and mechanical with his reads. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, he's, you know, he, there's a lot of times you see him kind of check the ball down to the flat or, or to the tight end. Well, there, there's a, there's Roman Wilson, the receiver cracking open in the middle of the field for a beginner. So he leaves a lot of plays on the football field uh, just because he wants to get the ball out of his hands quickly, uh, just you know, reads a play, reads the defense and, and sees the guy come open and gets rid of it. It's a split second later. If he kind of looks downfield a little bit longer, he'll see you know big play. So so he leaves some some yards out on the football field, and I think that's something that could be coached up out of him eventually when he gets to the NFL. Um, could stand to improve as, as a deep passer. Uh, you know, occasionally some of his, his throws are, are off balance, and, and his deep ball can sail on him. Right, so he gets a little, he gets himself a little off balance. The ball can sail on him. We've seen a couple times. Uh, and on some of his tape where the ball gets a little bit, you know, overthrown. Uh, there, there's times where some of the, some of these disguises and some of the coverages can trick him, right? You know, you see one of these, these, these robber defenders kind of lull him into a throw thinking it's open and next thing you jump in and pick him off. So, you know, there's things that those to me are coachable. Those, and this is a guy that is very, very coachable. So I think that's something that coaches see like, Hey, we, we can coach out of him. That that's not a big deal. You know, the, the fact that he's, he's got the athletic ability, the, the good arm strength, the, the ability to the play clock in his head, you know, uh, he's mobile in the pocket. He's a guy that can roll. Does a good job of, in terms of you know faking and selling that play action. All things you you want to see in an, an NFL type quarterback. And he's got that, that you know the football toughness, the character that you want to look for. And you know, and Jim Harbaugh has been talking him up as 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 the best quarterback he's ever seen come through Michigan. So um, you know that that's something that that you know, I think a lot of coaches are taking to heart. And I think this guy. He was a he was a you know he's something that, that caused you guys to laugh when I say he, he was going to go in the first round. Now he's going to go probably top six guys, and I, I and I wouldn't be surprised if Minnesota jumps up there. You know, what, what my thinking is is they they made that that pick that trade to get those two extra first round pick because they're going to jump up and they're going to jump up for either Drake May or JJ McCarthy. And I, I just it depends on those those if the Patriots are going to trade out of that 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 spot. Uh, but I think these are one of the two quarterbacks they're, they're going to eye and they're going to try to get one of these these guys. If Daniel Jones can go six overall, JJ McCarthy can go six overall. <laughs> Which is funny because, uh, you know, Jones and then uh, McCarthy, It's it, to me, it's sort of like making the same mistake over again. But uh, that's up for debate. Now, Mel Kuyper, by the way, did have uh, McCarthy going six to the Giants. So it's interesting that you say that. Well, I mean, I, there's talk that, that they might, they being Minnesota or whoever, might leap up. 
mm-hmm. and and go to number five with, with yeah. the Chargers and to jump the Giants because because that right. Giants already I already had him in for a visit I believe I, I think I saw that recently mm-hmm. so one of those you know, the, the top thirty visits so I think that he's there very talk to him um, and I, I I do think that there's a possibility teams like Denver you know uh, Raiders you know all these teams that need quarterbacks you know could look for a McCarthy as that fourth quarterback and, and try and jump up and and, and take him that's why I think I mean, if he's there at number nine for the Bears yeah. that pick that's yeah. going to bring a lot of action for mm-hmm. for Ryan. Now, if he's gone by then, then obviously it's it's all bets are off. Right. But we'll see what yeah, happens. I saw a, a report today that uh, J.C. Latham had a long uh, session at his pro day with the number five team, uh, Chargers, and so I don't see Latham as a top five pick. I but I, so I could see that scenario where they would trade back, accumulate some another pick or two, and then pick Latham. You know, sometime after the top ten pick. Right. So, like, for example, the Vikings have the 11th pick. Uh, the, the Broncos have the 12th pick. The Rays have the 13th pick. So, that, that 11, 12, 13, those three teams right there, they're all in need of the same thing, of a quarterback. Mm-hmm. And I, I think, yeah, if you're a Chargers and you get the two firsts from this year, maybe at first next year, and you drop back to 11 and still get Latham or maybe get Fuaga or get, get another another guy, you know, I think that, that – or maybe a receiver, right? You lost both of your starting receivers. So, I, mean, we, I, I think that that's a smart play for the Chargers. Yeah, indeed. All right, uh, that number three, you got the kid from North Carolina. One of the uh, questions early on uh, was from someone who said, is Drake May falling on some list because he's being compared to Mitch Trubisky? I don't think that's the no. case. <laughs> this is not Mitch Trubisky, guys. This is not no. Mitch. Mitch Trubisky, first of all, that 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 final season, his junior year in North Carolina, he, he, barely, he, he couldn't win the starting job from Marquise Williams. All right, Marquis Williams had to graduate for Mitch Trubisky to get to be a starter at, at North Carolina. All right, so this is a, this is a total different animal, totally different beast here. Uh, but but Drake May is is a guy that for most of the you know preseason coming into this college football campaign, he was neck and neck, one and one and one a with with Caleb Williams. Right, he's a guy mm-hmm. size 6'4", 223, four star high school recruit. This guy's only still twenty one years old. OK, uh, comes from an athletic, athletic family. He's, he's actually his passion is basketball. He's a very talented basketball player in high school. You know, his mm-hmm. dad played football in North Carolina. Uh, he, he was recruited actually by Alabama. Alabama, I think I think has, had him committed to go there. And then just the, the draw of, of the family, you know, lineage in, in North Carolina, I think had him then flip to North Carolina. But this guy was going to Alabama, Nick Saban. Um, again, you know, the, the brothers play basketball. Uh, two year start only the 2022 ACC player of the year. I uh, love the ACC in completions uh, and completion percentage and touchdowns in 2022. You know, uh, this year he lost, uh, you know, his top receivers. A couple of his receivers, uh, Green is, is in is in uh, Detroit with the Lions and and the uh, the slot receiver and uh, was with the Colts now. I forgot his name, but uh, very productive guys. Any losses, and, and he, got, he got a new offensive coordinator. So some of the things kind of downplayed him, hurt him in terms of this this final campaign. And you see some of that rustiness, or if you will, or some some lack of production on, on his film. But mm-hmm. when you go to his positives, excellent size, big frame with good movement skills for, for a big quarterback, uh, can move in the pocket, you know, can flow away from pressure, extend plays with his feet, and scan the field well outside the pocket. Uh, big arm, can zip it into tight windows, but also has the ability to kind of feather it in between those levels of the defense, the second and third level. Tough competitor, will stand in there and, and make a throw, will take a defender while the defender is barreling down on him. So he doesn't cow down or he doesn't doesn't duck or, or hide. Uh, good poise. We'll climb the pocket to, to buy time and, and keep scanning, you know, with bodies laying around his feet. Uh, solid release quickness. Can snap it real quick in, 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 in the face of pressure. Comfortable operating from within the pocket. You know, throws a catchable ball with timing and anticipation. Can throw receivers open on intermediate crossers. Can also throw off platform. Underrated runner with the football. And this is a guy that, you know, at 6'4", 220 plus pounds, can also, you know, run and, and, and lower his shoulder and run through arm tackles. Uh, so he, he had 16 rushing touchdowns in, in two seasons at North Carolina. So this is a guy that, while he's not the the athlete that some of the other two guys we're going to talk about soon here, he he's not a bad, he's not a you know, chump in terms of athletic ability. He's a guy that can use his legs, get to first downs, run through arm tackles. Again, 16 rushing touchdowns in the last two seasons. This guy's got some athletic ability for a guy 6'4", 220 some pounds. Uh, some of the things that that worry me. Mm-hmm. Shotgun predominantly. There's a guy that's going to have a big transition getting under center. Uh, you know, can't get happy feet in the pocket. You know, will throw from an unstable base. 
uh, will make predetermined throws and, and leave, or, or I should lock in on his pre-snap target and leave some open receivers off to the side and not even look at them. Uh, we'll stare down primary receiver, uh, needs to be able to, to do a better job of, of, of kind of manipulating the safeties. We always talk about, you know, the safeties for a quarterback are, are the are the main guys. You got to kind of manipulate them with your safety, with your eyes, get them out of position so you can then, you know, strike downfield and make big plays. He's got to learn to be more um, consistent with that. Accuracy can get a little bit spotty. You know, we'll, we'll make a receiver work for the catch. Deep balls can kind of sail on him as well. Mechanics, is, is I think, plays a big part in that. That's got to be cleaned up. Uh, boundary hash throws to the field side of the numbers can lose a little bit of steam. Um, uh, Post-snap decision-making and, and coverage recognition will need to improve. Zone coverage defenders uh, would lull them into some bad throws. Another one that we talked about, kind of just they kind of sit back and, and wait for them to kind of you feel a little, you know, feel good about his throw. And next thing they jump the route and, and get the ball, get their hands on the ball or, or, or pick it off. Um, has what I call a, a Philip Rivers like kind of slingshot delivery. Um, mm -hmm. So you see some of that as well. Um, and has for me, he has a little bit of a tell. And I, I haven't seen, uh, you know, it, it kind of reported anywhere. But to me, whenever he's in a pocket, he kind of pats the ball before he throws it. So I think that's a tell that that uh, quarterback coach kind of have to work on and, and, and kind of get, get out of system. But when he's on the run, Obviously, the ball is a little bit far away from him. He just, you know, flings it. But it's, it's when he's in the pocket, he kind of has that little pat of the ball before he throws it. Some say that doesn't matter. Some some don't like that. And I, I generally, when I when I look at my quarterbacks, I don't want them giving any advantage to to, to defensive backs, you know, saying, hey, the ball's coming out at this point. So that's something that he's going to work on. So those are things that, that, that you worry about. And he's a guy that, for me, in an ideal world, goes to a team and he sits for a year. And he did, does the whole Patrick Mahomes thing or, or the Jordan Love thing where he sits for a year or two and he develops. And the, the team, you know, if, if he goes in the top three, assuming that he goes third right now to the Patriots, that's a team that's lacking everything. They need an offensive line, they need receivers, they need a whole bunch of stuff, right? And actually, this might have been a good thing we should could ask Connor here. But, uh, you know, this is the thing where, where you, you lose him back behind Jacoby Brissett, their bridge quarterback, let that veteran play for a year, maybe whatever, two, who knows. And let this kid kind of develop at his own pace. And I think then once once he's comfortable, then he can you, you're taking some of those things that I kind of called out here uh, in terms of his sloppy mechanics with his feet and all that stuff. Get that out of his game. Next thing you know, you, you have a guy that that's ready ready to go. But very talented quarterback. Please, just because he's from North Carolina, do not compare him to Mitch Trubisky. This guy is nowhere near Mitch Trubisky. Uh, he's a he's a very talented quarterback. Like I said, he was actually committed to go to play for Nick Saban at Alabama. And because of the family ties and everything, ended up flipping that commitment to to North Carolina and playing there. So very talented quarterback, still needs some time, only 21 years old. But I think he's a guy that and his future is, is bright. All right, let's take a look at, uh, before we get to number two, I just wanted to, for our audio podcast audience primarily, Devin Leary, Danny has at number 10. He's the quarterback out of Kentucky. Jordan Travis out of FSU at number nine. Michael Pratt, the quarterback out of Tulane at eight. Spencer Rattler played at Oklahoma with Caleb, then went to South Carolina, is at number seven. Bo Nix, who Danny says would be a Perfect addition to the Sean Payton uh, quarterback room is at number six. Michael Penix, the lefty. I love lefties. He's at number five. J.J. McCarthy at number four. He just finished with Drake May at number three. And at number two, it is Jaden Daniels. What do you got on him, Danny? Yeah, another one, another highly touted four-star dual threat quarterback coming out of uh, high school. Went to Arizona State with Herm Edwards uh, for, for his first three seasons. Actually, Antonio Pierce was was there as well. The Raiders, uh, the Raiders head, uh, current head coach was there at, at, at Arizona State when he was there too. Um, started all three seasons and then transferred to LSU in 2022. He's a guy that that's another guy that's got experience. 55 games started. Uh, over his five, you know, five uh, five years in, in college football, five year starter, all all five years, is the only FBS player in history to pass for t over twelve thousand yards and rush for over three thousand yards. The only player in FBS history, uh, consensus All American this past season, obviously was the Heisman Trophy winner. Now, when when you when you put on Jane Daniels tape, and, I, and we talked about this a little bit last week, although in terms of mm -hmm. you know the, the the comparison or, or the 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 knock on Caleb Williams is is playing in structure. Right. And and when you put on this kid's tape, you see this kid playing in structure. And I'll get into that right now. But so some of the positives about him, obviously, you talked about the experience. I love that. Uh, good height, you know, a quick twitch athlete, super quick, calm feet in the pocket, balanced stance. Feet are always in a throwing 
uh, position. He's, he's, he's never, in terms of his feet in the pocket, they're never out of sorts. They're always ready to throw the ball. Um, strong arm, uh, throws, it, throws a pretty spiral, possesses a lightning quick release, can layer the ball at every level with accuracy, throws on balance, and is very effective creating plays you know, with his arm or his feet when the pocket moves. Can slide or move within the pocket to buy some time, displays good anticipation, ball placement, and accuracy on short and immediate throws, throws a beautiful, accurate deep ball with good arc and plenty of air underneath it, allowing his receivers to run underneath it, run underneath it and catch it. Uh, terrific touchdown and interception ratio last year, 40 touchdowns to just four interceptions. Um, and he's terrific as a runner, possesses game-breaking speed, is a threat to score whenever he breaks containment and gets away from, from the defense. So this guy can can literally, you know, kind of like Justin Fields, if he gets on the on the field, he's got that speed and the ability to be able to take it to the house at any any moment the ball's in his hands. So he's got that type of athletic ability. Uh, some of the negatives, and this one that bothers me and it's something that I, I just can't get over, is a slim frame. You know, you know, the question is, can he hold on weight? Can he put on weight and, and maintain it? Um, you know, he takes a lot of punishment. And uh, when he's out there running, you know, he's a guy that has to learn how to slide. He's got to learn how to tuck himself, get out of bounds. He doesn't do any of that on his college tape. And he's he, a couple of times he takes some shots that I'm like, how does he get up off, off of that? So that's something that's going to be coached out of him because he's not going to survive in the NFL if he does that. Uh, Tennessee to stare down his primary target and, you know, will not go through a progression. You know, and in the same vein, we'll miss or not pull a trigger on a throw on an open target. So we've got a theme here, right? We got these guys that that are creative, that are athletic, that that can create plays with their with their feet. You know, Jaden Daniels, Caleb Williams, Justin Fields. You know, they, they just hold on to that. They don't take the easy throw. They don't take the guy crossing the middle for a five or six yard game. They're looking to say, all right, you know, I, I can buy some more time because I'm that kind of an athlete. I have that that type of athletic ability. And he does the same thing here with Jane Downs. You see the same thing where he just holds on to the ball, misses a guy, or somebody that doesn't even look at, at the other side. He's just looking at his primary guy and doesn't even look. So he leaves a lot of big plays, a lot of yards on, on the football field. Um, operated with, with a very strong strong supporting cast. So uh, obviously you don't want to knock him for that, but you also have taken into consideration. You know, he's got you know two first-round picks here coming up, uh, two high first-round picks at receiver. Uh, you know, So that helped pass some of the stats. So his production could be a little bit in, inflated there. Um, again, takes too many hits as a runner. We already talked about that. And for me, he's a one-year wonder. Uh, he, he's never had this type of year. Uh, you know, the previous season, I think he had 17 touchdowns and, and three interceptions, something like that. Wasn't horrible, but was, wasn't great. You know, this is the first year he really kind of put it all together. Uh, and some might knock him for that. It's something I just take into consideration because you know, Joe Burrow was, was, was a day three guy coming into his, his last year at LSU, and then he exploded with Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase, and some of the guys he had on, on his roster. And look, you know, he's – been the goods here at Cincinnati. So, you know, you don't want to kind of totally kind of throw it out the window and say, oh, just a one-year wonder is because you got all these guys at LSU. But you got to have to put into consideration now that the, the experience, the athletic ability, the ability to, to be a, a big threat with your, with your feet is is very, very enticing. But for me, he's, he's, he's even though he's the guy that that is more fit to play in a structured offense, basically one, two, three, bam, get the ball out of your hands. One, two, three, four, five, get the ball here. Or, or, and throws a beautiful deep ball. And again, again, I keep harping about like that running ability. He's a guy that, that I think a lot of teams say, all right, this guy could be ready-made, could re- fit, our, fit our system, and be ready to go from day one. So I think that's why there's the discussion now is 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 he a higher rate of prospect than than and then Caleb, right? Uh, because those are some of the things that Caleb might not do in terms of playing in structure. So uh, so I think that Jay Nell is a guy that I think right now is cemented at number two. And um, at, at one point, I, I thought that. Ryan Poles was looking at him. And uh, his pro day is next week, I think, on the 27th. Correct. So I, I would say, that, I mean, uh, they're meeting with J.J. McCarthy, I think, Friday at Michigan. And I think right. meeting with him and with, with Jane Daniels next week. So I, I I don't think they'll flip. But, I mean, I mean, this kid has has some some talents there that, that if they do flip, I mean, I'd, I'd be shocked. But I, I'd, I'd see why they flip. When you talk about Jaden Daniels' fragility, it, would you compare it to Bryce Young? Um, no, I, I, and the thing about him is he's got good size at six three six four. Uh, it's just the the thin. His frame is really really thin. Now it, they they have listed at two ten. He didn't weigh himself at the combine, right? So that that throws up you know uh, alarms, right? And you must people will say, oh well, 
look at Marvin Harrison Jr. Well, Marvin Harrison Jr. is a different story. That's a different, whole different story. Mm-hmm. Uh, this guy is, is, is they want to see how, how big he is, right? And and if he comes in at 210, the first thing I thought of when he didn't weigh himself was like, all right, this guy is underweight. He's going to go put on some water weight and weigh in LSU's pro day. If he, if he weighs in with, with today's this, this draft class, you never know if he's going to get weighed in or not. Uh, if he weighs in, he's probably got 210, 215. Um, but the thing is, like, you know, can he maintain the weight? And 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 then the other thing is you got to coach him to protect himself because that thin frame, man, some of these NFL linebackers, you know, they see a quarterback break containment. They are going to try and come in and, and tear his head off. So you know, that's, that's my fear with, with, with Jane Daniel. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Hopefully for the kid, I'll be, you know, he doesn't doesn't get hurt. Uh, I just it's the, the Bryce Young thing. He was just small. 5'10 and thin, that's a recipe for disaster for me. But this guy, no, this guy has the ability uh, in terms of the height. He's got, you know, the the, um, the ability to get rid of the, fall, the ball quickly, and he can see over, over the offensive and defensive line. So that, that's not – my just thing is it's just a thin, slight frame. Can he maintain his weight? That's 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 a big question. And I agree with Bruce Ollie Walter Jordan in the chat. He says he looks more like 175 than 210. But, right, uh, and that's the reason why he didn't want to get himself weighed in at, at the combine. That's that's yeah. my guess. Yeah, yeah. that's a good guess. All right, uh, we are down to number one. Surprise, surprise. It is Caleb Williams out of USC. Uh, you talked a lot about him with our guest. Uh, what can, more can you add? Right, so obviously, we, you know, all the accolades we know, the 2022 Consensus All-American, the, the Heisman Trophy winner, the Pac-12, you know, uh, play, Offensive Player of the Year, uh, this is a guy that, that was a highly decorated kid coming out of D.C. in high school, went to went to Oklahoma. We already kind of touched this on it when we talked about Spencer Rattler. You know, ha- Spencer Rattler is coming off of a freshman of the year campaign and, and second season uh, struggles a little bit. And this kid comes on a football field and takes his job. So that that's kind of uh, the kind of pedigree uh, Caleb Williams has um, in terms of his positives for me, for Caleb. Even though he's got average size, you know, he's in terms of height, uh, he has a strong lower half. And we saw some of that in the pro day. We saw some of the, the build and, and the power in, in, in his lower frame there. You know, he uses his legs to help drive the, the ball downfield. Quick feet, loose hips, can use his body control and athletic ability to go be able to stop, start, twist, and turn with, you know, to be able to avoid and, 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 um, and avoid uh, defenders as, as he's running with the football as a ball carrier. Outstanding arm talent. Uh, you know, can, can drive the ball with high velocity and make tight window throws. This is the one thing that that I think this one trait I'm going to talk about here is what makes him elite. He's got a quick release. Uh, it's one of those releases where he can be running with the football like a madman, have it down by his, by his thighs, and he can just get, get it back. He can reload it and throw it down the football field you know, 40 yards on a dime to a receiver. So, I mean, that's something that you don't see often. You know, a lot of quarterbacks have to reload, get the ball back in a throwing position, this guy was just in like a, you know, less than a second, less than you know, 10 seconds can get the ball back into a throwing position and throw it down the football field. That's the trait that he has that, that in my opinion, is, is elite. Um, you know, throws, you know, a f- uh, fine downfield touch and accuracy from any location, manipulates his arm and, and throws uh, off platform with ease. Uh, this guy that can alter his release point. You'll see him throw from an over-the-top uh, motion, sidearm motion, a three-quarter delivery from a very a variety of angles. Uh, you know, film is, is I talked about earlier. Film is loaded with wild throws, right? Uh, it, it was like, how did he complete that? How did he throw that? Um, you know, talking about you know, running, uh, uh, climbing the ladder off one leg, sixty yards hits. You know, Brendan Rice on on, on the dead run uh, versus UCLA. I mean, stuff like that. You know, like, and there's a couple plays against Washington. Or like, holy crap, how do you make that throw? Um, very good awareness, you know, to move his feet and spin out of, of pressure to find open open throwing lanes and, and buy himself some second second chance opportunities. Effective sidestepping that initial wave and improvising on rollouts and bootlegs can convert broken plays into big chunk gains. We see that all the time on his tape. And, and functional run, run strength on RPOs and keepers. He's got really quick hands in terms of the RPO game. Uh, you, know, you know, there's times out where he just kind of keeps the ball and defenders don't even see the ball coming out of the running back's belly. So, you know, that kind of stuff really helps him in that RPO game. Um, obviously, some of the some of the negatives with, with Caleb. You know, loose with the ball. We talked about it earlier with with Connor. Thirty three fumbles in his career. You know, you see him kind of holding it, you know, low and away, and not tucking it all the time. And a lot of times, it gets knocked out. So that's something that's got to work on. Uh, erratic decision uh, decision maker uh, on most plays that that are outside the the framework of the offense. What I mean by that is, 
you know, we talked about earlier, you know, there, there are some plays where he gets out of the pocket and then he's, he's trying to make a play downfield. And instead of just, you know, maybe throwing it for again, a five or 10, 50, he's looking to make that big play. And the next thing you know, he just tucks out of bounds or he runs out of bounds or, you know, it was an incompletion, like, like just, just erratic, you know, play when he gets out of the pocket, because he's always looking for that big play downfield. And that's something that's going to have to get coached out of him. He's going to have to play within structure of the offense. Um, very reliant over his arm talent and playmaking abilities and, and can get careless with his mechanics and delivery. A lot of times you see his feet get, get, you know, get funky because he's running around and trying to make things happen and the pocket's collapsing around him. So, you know, he's not a, again, not a guy that, that, that's got that, you know, that, that set, that set motion, that set throwing style, you know, feet are all always planted always, you know, he doesn't need to do that all the time because he can still rifle the ball down a football field. But again, when you get to the next level and you have, you know, NFL defenders going after you. I think that's something you have to, you have to clean up. You have to get coached out of you. Um, and, you know, in terms of uh, – um, it's a guy that you see a lot of throws off his back foot. You know, you see him always retreating from the back of the pocket when the pressure's collapsing instead of kind of like stepping up and maybe and getting out from the side or getting out from the front. And steps in the back, and next thing you know, he's off his back foot, heaving the ball down a football field. So some of the bad habits that, that have developed, albeit I, I've seen some on, on both the 2022 and 2023 tape, but I saw most of them – a lot more last year on 2023. We touched on it with Connor and some of the, the you know, the, the guys, the offensive line wasn't great. And, and he, and he, you know, he kind of felt that Connor felt like that, you know, Caleb was always kind of, you know, trying to get points and trying to get his team back in the game because the defense was so bad. So, you know, those are things that to me are, are, you know, hopefully coachable. And, and he's, this is a kid that, that can get, take coaching and, and, and get some of those bad habits out of him. But again, his ability to get rid of that football, that lightning quick release to throw off with different platforms at different arm angles, um, is, you know, as long as you get him in that in the structure of an offense and, and be, you know, be a p- effective, you know, pocket passer, like everyone was, was claiming Justin Fields wasn't, you know, I think then you have something here where um, something that you can develop here and, and, and turn into a really damn good quarterback. Again, I hate using that generational, that generational tag. I, I will not use it on any quarterback coming out of or any prospect coming out of the draft because you have to go out and prove it to us. Right. You know, Andrew Luck was a last generational talent that I, I saw and he really didn't have that long of a career. Uh, you know, T- Trevor Lawrence was supposed to be generational. He never turned out. Patrick Mahomes was never called generational, and he's generational, right? You know, Joe Burrow was never called generational, and he's probably generational. So, you know, it, it, I just let's slow down with the with the, with the that generational term and, and elite as well. So he's a, he's a talented kid, very talented kid, and I think he's he's a guy that that when he talks about loving football and just wanting to win and have that competitive drive, he's saying all the right things, and that's what you want to hear. So we'll see what we see how it turns out. He's a very likable guy, and you know the more and more I read about him, like I, I read that it, at, when he played that game at Oklahoma and he got put into the game, you know he told his teammate who was next to him, "It's Caleb time," and mm-hmm. so it, it was like a declaration that this is it, first big game here at Oklahoma against Texas stadium is filled. This is the big stage and so forth. And on that first play on a fourth down and one, he takes it in for a 66 yard touchdown. Yeah. And yeah. you see him on the sideline interacting with his teammates, you know, he, all of these concerns about maybe he's selfish and so forth. If he is so far, there's been no public a clue of that. He hasn't said anything that makes him seem selfish. There haven't been any public reports. You know, like we've we heard it prior to the draft when Justin Fields, we heard stuff that he was lazy, which all was bull. You know, but we haven't even heard any of those rumors. There's been some backdoor stuff that you know Greg Gabriel on the Barroom Network here said he was concerned about what some people have told him about Caleb, but you know, for the most part, there has been no allegations, you know, straight up allegations that this guy is going to be a troublemaker in the clubhouse. So that's good. No, I, I don't think I, I refer back to prior to the season starting, you know, uh, before the college football season started, I was talking about Caleb Williams. And I said, you know, this is what I would heard from a couple of scouts that, you know, they, there's a lot of questions he has to answer off the football field, right? The, the mm-hmm. whole me versus we thing. Does he love football? And, and again, I'm not in these meetings, so I, I don't know that the, the honest answer, but just kind of like, it's kind of like you said, we're watching him on the more we get exposed to him in terms of, interviews and, and and he comes off as as a genuine guy he comes mm-hmm. off as, as a guy that that loves football and as a guy that that can relate to his teammates so uh hopefully that is the case and and that's something that that you know that whole stigma that was about him that it was all just you know hearsay and 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 whatnot but uh you know as long as he you know he he falls in line and and you know, you want your guy to be confident 
right? You want your guy, your quarterback, your face of the franchise to be a guy that believes in his talents and believes that he could do, you take your franchise to, to, a, to a heights that it hasn't achieved before. And that's what you want from a guy, especially a first overall pick. So those are all good. Those are all positives to me. You know, it's, it's just the incorporating him in, in the locker room. Uh, you know, Jalen Johnson, I don't know if you've seen the clips uh, with, with Kay Adams. He, he, he said some, some things were uh, interesting in terms of like, you know, the, the, she obviously – he said, if, if it's Caleb Williams, you know, the whole Hollywood thing is going to have to kind of, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but the whole, whole Hollywood thing is going to have to, you know, be, you know, kind of figured out and he's going to have to come in and, and, and you know, uh, kind of, you know, appreciate himself to, to the locker room and to the guys that have been here for years and, and, and have been productive and have been NFL stars. You know, he's just a rookie kind of thing, you know, and, and um, so it, it's, it's, you know, but John Johnson is one of those leaders on that team. So we'll see how that goes. But I, as long as he, you know, comes in and, and understands he's a rookie. He could be confident. He could be cocky, but he is a rookie, and he's gonna have to, you know, go through his rookie rookie struggles early on, and 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 you know, get the trust and and the, uh, you know, the, the belief in, in his teammates. And I think if he does that, I think he, he should be fine. Yeah, in his uh, social media account, uh, as part of his bio or profile, he quotes Jay Z saying, "You know, I'm not a businessman. I'm a business, comma man." And so he definitely is building a brand. He's not, you know, like most quarterbacks come into the team and they're thinking team first, team first. He definitely has his eye on building his brand and maybe developing it like Michael Jordan did. But Michael Jordan did it, you know, it was much more focused after he had had success. It, he didn't come into the league, you know, with, with uh, you know, a, a whole he- market. I think more it's more LeBron James than Michael Jordan. Yeah, LeBron James came into the league with all the fanfare and hype, and then as he started kind of going, and, and everyone's like, "Oh man, this guy is the real deal." Mm-hmm. Now you started him kind of building his empire, and and, and now you see what what kind of businessman LeBron has turned into. Yeah, there's an interesting article on uh, Caleb Williams that was done before the start of his final season at USC. Uh, you can find it on Google. Just Google Vanity Fair Caleb Williams. And you'll see uh, lots of pictures of him in various fashion states and so forth. But the article kind of gives you a real, a real good indication as to who he is. And I think that article might have sparked off the, you know, hey, you know, this guy's coming into the league with a totally different approach to the game. So if the Bears think that he loves football, the talent is there. And this should be a no-brainer then, like you said, Danny. All right, let's change our focus now. I want to answer some of the questions that have been posed, and then we'll uh, go on to our final topic, which is to talk about the trade that was made. So let's go on to – I asked people in the chat, Danny, you know, what should the Bears do with the number one pick? So I'd love for you to to react to some of these uh, uh, responses. Jay Grizz says, I'd like to see Alt drafted if – he is still there at nine, and there are a lot of people, despite the fact that they like Braxton Jones, but, you know, Alt is not a generational player, but he's probably the best left tackle in this draft and might be the best we've seen in a few years. Yeah, so I don't want to spoil my next week's top ten, but but we're doing offensive tackles next week, and, and Alt will be your number one tackle on, on that list. And 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 Jay Grizz, I, I agree. At, at number nine, for me, and that's how, that's how I'm looking at it, um, at number nine, if if if, the, if any of the three receivers are there, uh, I would take one of them. If any of the, the, the top two tackles, which Alt is one and, and Fuanga from Oregon State is my second tackle, uh, if those guys are there, those guys are worth the, the ninth pick. Now, if those guys are all gone, um, obviously the, the, my first inclination is to trade down. Um, now, obviously you need a, you need a trade partner, so not necessarily not anyone's going to come here, you know. So you need two to tangle, right? So assuming mm-hmm. no one comes up to wants a pick. And those guys are all gone, and at that, that point, now, you, now, you, now you're going to start reaching for, for a guy. So the edge guys, w- which I like, Latu, Turner, and and um, Jared Verse from Florida, I like all three of them. However, I, I think at number nine, they're they're not they're not there in terms of the the value for the pick, right? So so to answer your question, if if Alt or if Fuanga or if any of those three receivers are there. Those are those are the, the the group that I'm picking from at number nine. If I can't trade down, all right. Cliff uh, had said that uh, at ninth pick, Adunza, as you just mentioned, you know, and it's interesting that um, who was it? Uh, was it Jeremiah has Adunze 
going with the ninth pick to the Chicago Bears and Eric Galco from the East West Shrine Bowl game, who was Greg's guest on Monday, said he has heard that they have a tight relationship and uh, he, you know, he, he is clearly aware that uh, the Bears now have uh, two excellent wide receivers, but he thought that that's probably what's going to transpire. Transpire if Adunze is there. If all these quarterbacks are going to go early, Danny, then Adunze should be there at nine, don't you think? Yeah, Adunze should be there at nine. One of the tackles should be there at nine. Um, and then now, now if you're Ryan Poles and company, I'm thinking, all right, if you if you get a call for 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 one of those players, right? So so a team's gonna, you know, like I was I was looking at, at the first round and saying, like, all right, who who could be a trade partner, right? Obviously, I, I think if, if McCarthy goes in the top five, like we just discussed earlier, I I don't think there's a quarterback a teams are going to jump up to trade for. I don't think someone's going to come up and get Bo Nix, for example. I think Denver could sit there at 12 and, and take them. Denver could, could trade down from 12 and still get Bo Nix probably. It, it's, it's my assumption, right? Uh, so who are players that teams can come up for? You know, Adonze could be one of them. You know, Malik, Malik Neighbors, if he's there, could be one of them. The tackles could be one of them, right? Um, so, you know, what, what teams are, are sitting there at, at, you know, pick 12? Now, obviously, the Bengals are one one team I was looking at, but they just signed Trent Brown to be to be their right tackle. So I think they, they fortified their offensive line for at least this season. You know, uh, you know, you look at teams like the Jets, you know, they, they went, they, they traded for Morgan Moses. They, they got Tyron Smith, but Tyron Smith is always injured seemingly. So, you know, are they comfortable sitting there at, at 10 and in, in, in letting another team possibly jump up? Could you know, Brian Poles go down one spot again and recoup some, some picks? My thing is, and you know me, Aldo, they only have four picks in this draft, right? So, and, and you have way many, many holes. You have an edge, a hole, a, a edge rusher hole. You have another receiver hole. You have an interior offensive lineman hole. You have a defensive tackle hole. You have a, a bunch of bunch of holes on this team that you need to get picks. So, number nine is 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 if is where I'm thinking like if polls can can recoup some of these draft picks. So, you know, if if uh, McCarthy is still there, number nine, now you got. The Raiders at 13 come calling. You know, you'll you'll probably have the Vikings come calling at, at number 11. Um, you know, Denver doesn't have a second round pick. Well, neither neither the Minnesota. So I don't think Minnesota will give you two first round picks for 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 two spots. So so I, you know you know you talk about Raiders. You talk about may, may, could the Saints be interested in coming up here and getting their cars? You know, heir apparent uh, in, in New Orleans. So you know th- that's what you got to look for. You got to see how the board plays out. Uh, but like we talked about earlier, if if three, if four quarterbacks go in the top six, now you're sitting there looking at either a receiver or offensive lineman, and and I, I would not hate taking either either Fuanga, putting him on a right a right guard, or putting him a right tackle and kicking Darnell right into right guard and fortifying that that right side because I know he had a, it was his first year and he had some some family stuff early in the year, but I'm looking to get Nate Davis off off the football field. Uh, that that last game for me against Green Bay was was the, albeit the whole entire offensive line had a had a bad night, but just that game put a bad taste in my mouth. And I, I if I can get Nate Davis off the football field and put him on the bench, that's what I, that's what I would try to do. Yeah, I think you know that they're going to take a really good look at him uh, during camp, and I I think with the with the depth that has been developed and what we saw, how they handled Cody White here in his last few games with the Bears, I think they will not hesitate to put Nate Davis on the bench and go with some of these depth guys. Um, hopefully uh, the problems that Davis had last season, both on and off the field, are behind him, and he has a great season with us. Bruce Ali Walter Jordan wanted to know, what is the – uh, can you characterize the drop in talent from Caleb Williams to Jaden Daniels? The drop in talent, um, well, in, in, in terms of overall athlete, I mean, I think Jaden Daniels is a better overall athlete, uh, but obviously we talked about the size there, that the, the, the thin frame worries me. Um, you know, the, the elite, uh, the elite ability of, of Williams to be able to get rid of that football with that quick release, um, the thing that, to, to make things happen, uh, the, the arm angle stuff, like that stuff that Jay Nails doesn't have. He, Jay Nails is more of a guy in, the, in a structure. He's not a guy that, that can do that the three three quarter arm arm angle thing and, and get rid of the football. He's a guy that that you know uh, if if a thing breaks down, if first second we aren't there. From what I've seen at LSU, he tucks in and runs, and he's got that special ability to you know to, to make things happen with that. So you know I, I think Caleb is more of a guy that you know while he's he's athletic to be able to get away from pressure and and could run with the football, he's generally not looking he's not looking to run with the football. He's looking to to escape, buy some time, and make these 
you know, sensational throws down a football field. So I think when it comes to that, I, th- I think that's where Caleb kind of, you know, takes over in terms of that ability to, with, the, with the ball to, to throw. He's got that special talent. Now, Jay Nails can throw a deep, a beautiful deep ball. Uh, again, he's a guy, you know, he's got the quick release as well, but just not to, to the echelon and to, to, the, to the level of Caleb Williams, in my opinion. Excellent. All right, let's see what else we got here in terms of questions. Uh, Cliff wanted to know, so is Caleb the guy? And you know what you, he means by the guy? <laughs> is he the guy? I mean, in terms of starter from week one, yes, he's a starter. No, week no one. I, I think what he means is, is he Patrick Mahomes? Is he Tom Brady? Is he that good? We don't, we don't know. I mean, obviously, you know, Patrick Mahomes wasn't Patrick Mahomes. You know, he sat a year. Patrick Mahomes sat a year behind Alex Smith and took a year to develop and, and learn. Uh, you know, remember he he came out and admitted, he said, you know, I couldn't identify the middle linebacker in my, my first year. So, you know, he took it took him a year to sit there and learn and, and get ready. So, you know, in terms of is Caleb the guy, you know, he's got he's got talent to, to be to be special. But, you know, I, again, I talked about it earlier. I don't like the, these terms of elite and generational and all that stuff until the guy gets on a football field and proves it. Now, if, if your question, Cliff, is, is he – a guy that, that's going to start week one and, and, and be the starter. Yes, I, I believe that that is the case. Um, but, you know, if he's going to be the guy to, to break this cycle that we've been through here in Chicago with, with you know, ro- rotating quarterbacks, I think time will tell. Um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, I think, you know, he's, he's got a chance. But I, I just obviously you don't, you don't know. There's there is no perfect, perfect prospect. Right. Well, and that gets to the topic of uh, veteran free agent uh, quarterbacks because I, and the topic of of uh, Justin Fields because you know the more and more I think about this situation the more and more I think perhaps we should have just kept Justin Fields and told both of these guys Caleb and Justin guys you better get along Justin is the starter in 2024 and uh, unless something happens uh, and Caleb has to go in there for injury or whatever but Justin is a starter because we need a veteran. And just like you said about Mahomes, he sat that first year. It, it would should have been a no-brainer. Like Mel Kuyper was the one that kind of planted the thought. You know, what are they doing? Training him for a six-round pick. You know, that's I right. I said it all along. I said, I said, why why get rid of Justin? You don't have to get rid of Justin. You can just keep him, bring in a quarterback you want, and let him compete. And I, Justin, I know that the competitor he is, I think he would have taken on the challenge and I think I think he would have taken on. Now, Caleb Williams could have been a different story. He could have been someone that like, oh, I'm no more in pick. I want to be playing first. And, and there, there, there lies a problem, right? Where you could have a split locker room, where you have the veterans who want Justin, the guys who are loyal to Justin, um, and you're gonna have some guys that might want Caleb in there. And, and then obviously you want you know the the, the head coach and the, and the the general manager want Caleb in there because that that's our guy, that's our pick. So I think it would just make for for a, a messy situation. But that, that was my initial thought. I was like. Justin is, is a competitor. Well, he won't back down. He'll go after this and say, all right, let's go, you know, and uh, let's go after this and see the best man may win, you know? So, uh, and then after the, after the competition has been settled, whether, you know, if Kale beats out Justin, now you can say, all right, we can go in and try and trade Justin, but that, that's not, that's not the way it works. So, you know, I, I, but yeah, I do. I, they do need a veteran. Um, you know, Tyson Bajan obviously will be going to his second year. He's learning the system, a whole new system. Uh, so, I, I mean, how comfortable are you with Tyson Bajan as, as your backup quarterback? Uh, you know, Brett Rippon was brought in. He's just a camp arm. He's he's not a guy that. I mean, he was so bad that the Rams cut him and brought in Carson Wentz off the couch to to start the, the following week. So so Brett Rippon is just a camp arm. Please do, let's not get any thoughts about Brett Rippon being on this on, on his roster. Oh, you know, what was funny is um, Nate Peterman was, was was training with with Caleb Williams when when Caleb Williams. Yeah. And and I'm surprised, like, well, Nate Williams got, I mean, I'm sorry, Nate Peterman got signed to the Saints roster. Mm-hmm. That would have been the guy, the veteran, to bring in here, a guy that, that you know, Caleb already knows and, and guy who couldn't, you know, know the system. But so that, that was that was a curious move there. But, yeah, I think they knew their veteran. Uh, I mean, obviously some of the guys right there on the market right now, like Ryan Tannehill, I, I don't think I, I'm a big, you know, big proponent for getting him. Uh, you, know, the, you know, you look over the list, it's it's pretty, pretty bare. You know, Mark, you know Matt Barkley, you know, Blaine Gabbert, you know, guys like that are out there right now, A.J. McCarron. You know nothing really that that sparks the interest. The only thing I could tell you is, and, and, and another thing with other position of need, is you know we've been through the first wave of free agency, the second wave of free agency. There's going to be a third wave, and that's going to come after the draft, where, where teams you know fill needs through the draft. That now they find a veteran on the roster that they don't need anymore. They could they could trade them during the draft. They could maybe cut them 
trade him or cut him after the draft. So there's going to be a third wave of veteran free agents, and I think that's where maybe you know, you know Ryan Poles and them can can see who comes loose. There's a quarterback on the market that that they feel comfortable bringing in here and and being a, you know a backup to to Caleb because you do need that veteran presence in that room, someone that that's been there for a while that could kind of you know uh, kind of guide the, uh, the young guy both because even Bajan too he's he's only second year, yeah. so I think you know a veteran presence in that room to, to kind of guide these guys. So I, I do think there's a veteran out there that that you know to be added to this to this, whether it's like a Blaine Gabbert or something like that. Uh, you, Tana, you know, hopefully Tana Hill. What about Tannehill? Is, uh, Tannehill is a guy. Like, I, 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 don't, I wonder about him. It's, it's it's just I've never seen him as a guy that that is a someone that that would welcome a a, a young kid and, and kind of take him under his wing and, and show him the ropes. I don't I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But uh, maybe maybe Tannehill could could be a guy. Uh, but but definitely need a veteran that can come in here and just kind of give these you know give these kids you know the lay of the land and of the NFL in terms of what to expect and at least someone that in between series. You know, if they're having a bad, you know, bad couple of series, kind of, kind of settle them and talk to them. Now, I know the quarterback coach is there, and, and Thomas Brown uh, has been added to a position of uh, of offensive pass pass game coordinator. So mm-hmm. uh, maybe that that's going to be the sounding board for 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 Caleb Williams. Who knows? But uh, I do I do think that you know I would like to see him at least bring in a veteran to kind of at least you know bring some you know some some maturity to that room. All right, so let's get to the topic of the Justin Fields trade. I've shared my opinion uh, yesterday on Bear Their Souls. I'm dying to hear. You and I haven't really talked since since uh, before the trade. So what are your thoughts? Uh, how distressing was it for you? And you know, how disappointed were, are, were you with the value we got back from the Steelers? Well, I, I got a lot of thoughts. So so first of all, first and foremost, we knew it was going to happen, right? It, it, it was it was all written on the wall, and, and I'll get on, to, on that, that point a little bit later on. But first and foremost, I just want to say I am happy for Justin because he landed in the in the absolute best place for him. Mm-hmm. A couple of things. He's, he's with an organization, a stable organization, an organization that knows how to win, an organization that's got a stable head coach, uh, an organization that brought in an offensive corner that I was calling for, if you guys remember, when they fired – Look, Getsy, Arthur Smith was was the first guy I put on my list as a guy to bring in here because he builds his offense off of the run game, off of the play action and, and quarterback under center. And what I've been, what was I yelling all last year on before 55? Get Justin under center. Use the run game. You're a running team, Luke Getsy. Use that play action. And then now you can take shots on the field. And that's where Justin's strength was, was getting the ball down a football field. It never, it never transpired here for whatever reason. Arthur Smith was a guy that would do that. Now Justin has a chance to go there again. Stable organization, great organization, stable head coach, uh, and now he's got an offense corner that I believe can f- uh, build a system around his strengths. And I think, you know, I know this time Russell Wilson, and Russell Wilson is the quote unquote starter going to. I, I, I give it three or four weeks, and I think Justin Fields takes over that job, and I think mm-hmm. Justin Fields keeps that job, and I think he's then develops into the Steelers franchise quarterback, and I think the Bears will get a fourth-round pick next year, not a sixth-round pick. And in terms yeah. of the value, the compensation, mm-hmm. Ryan, Ryan Poles, I think, blew it. I, I, Ryan Poles blew this the minute he opened his mouth at the combine and said he's going to do right by Justin Fields. That pretty much told the whole NFL, yep. hey, we're, we're, we're going to trade Justin Fields. I want to do it right by him. So why the hell would a, would a GM who wants Justin Fields – Give you a second, and for initial, I don't know if this is true. Or not. I was told it was a second and a fifth they're asking for it. Then it came down to a second. Then it came down to a third, and then, and it kept coming down. Why would they give any of these valuable picks if you, they already know you're gonna you're gonna trade them? You're not gonna keep them. So why would they do that, right? right. So I think Ryan Poles blotched, you know, blew this whole thing up. It blew up in his face. I think he thought teams were gonna come running to him and and, and asking for Justin. He didn't play it right. If he had played his cards close to his vest and just said, you know what? Justin's our quarterback. We haven't drafted anybody. We're going through the process, but we're very happy with Justin. You know, we're, and we're very content with, with going into next season with Justin taking that next step and, and continuing to grow. And talking like that in, in generic terms, not saying you're not drafting a quarterback, not saying Justin's a, the starter for sure, but also not saying you're going to do it right by Justin. Because when you say that, that tells the whole NFL, all right, you don't come out and say, I'm going to do right by this quarterback and trade him to a, to a team that, that, that that's, that's best for him. If you if you're going to keep him, because that's your starting quarterback, that's your franchise quarterback. You just don't do that. And I think Ryan Poles blew it. They they got a sixth round pick. Like I said, I I feel like it's going to be a fourth round pick by when the time's all said and done. Uh, I, I do believe Philadelphia was interested in, in Justin Fields. I think they they were offering that fourth round pick that that, that you know Rappaport reported that it was a it was a higher value pick, but he would go there as a backup. And I think Justin wanted to be when well, he wanted to go to compete with Pittsburgh and with with Russell Wilson, and that's why. 
Poles and company did right by him and, and sent him to Pittsburgh. So, but yeah. but I'm happy for Justin. First and foremost, he's gonna I, I, he's a guy that I think is gonna is gonna flourish over there. He's got a good defensive team. He's got a good running attack. He's got an offensive coordinator that, that's gonna I, I feel call a game plan to his strengths. Like I said, stable organization. I think this is a perfect place for Justin. I'm so happy for him. I think he's going to now take the next step in, in his career. And I think that is the Steelers got their franchise quarterback for basically a, a sixth or possibly even fourth round pick. So I just think Ryan Poole should not call Pittsburgh anymore. He shouldn't deal with Omar Khan anymore because between the, the clay pool for that 32nd pick and then this, this thing, it, I think Ryan Poole's is, is, is not good in terms of trading with Omar Khan. Yeah, it's, it, that's a whole bizarre thing, you know, and, and it seems like, Pol- well, Poles has made some good trades. There's no doubt about it. The Montez trade was, was good, but you're and right. And right. that, that pick, number one pick last year trade ended up being a good trade, especially because yes. you got the first this year. Absolutely. So Absolutely. But the trades with the Steelers have been problematic. Um, what uh, what do you think about the the issue regarding Poles might have gotten a better trade offer, but wanted to do right by Justin Fields. Fields wanted to go to Pittsburgh. Do you think that that was malpractice by Poles? If indeed he was offered a fourth round draft pick and he said, well, my quarterback doesn't want to go there, so I'll take the Pittsburgh deal. Do you think that's good business or that uh, or is you know should the Bears be angry at him? Well, from my understanding, it, the 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 deal was a fourth round pick. So so he, he you know and, and but Justin would have been a backup, and Justin didn't want to go to Philadelphia and be a backup. He wanted to go to compete. And I, I but, think but the thing is, just, who cares what Justin wants? And I think I think he I think he looked at it kind of similar. To I looked at it like I think Justin's going to go in there, he's going to win that job, and we're going to end up getting a fourth round pick anyway for him. So I, I think that's I think that's where he kind of kind of said, and I do and I do right by Justin, you know, because I, I I've done him right by you know for the first year or, or whatever, you know, these last two years. So I think that's something where, because you know, you know this is this all relationship, right? You know, David 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 Malata, the the, J, the agent for Justin Fields, is a high power agent in the NFL. You know, if mm-hmm. if you screw Justin Fields, it's going to come back to bite you eventually. So I think this is also a thing where you you and I'll eventually now if a team's offering a second round pick for Justin. <laughs> and you, you can't, now you now that's that's not doing your your job. That's obviously that's right. a fireball right. offense because you you're like all right, Justin, I love you, and and but we're getting a second round pick here. You know that that's not you know a sixth or or, or, or a fourth round pick. You know, this this is a you know a day day two you know, guy come in and start for us. So th- that's different. But it, if if the rumors is, is what I heard was true, is that it was a fourth round. Basically, what what they give up for Kenny Pickett is what Philadelphia was offering for for Justin Fields. But Justin wanted to go somewhere where he can, could compete and, and win a job, and I, and I think he landed in a, in a perfect situation because I, I like him in, Phil, in Pittsburgh better than I would like him in Philadelphia. Even with Jalen Hurts not there, I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of Kellen Moore, and I, I think Pittsburgh with Arthur Smith with with that head coach and with that that defense and that organization, perfect spot for Justin Fields. Flex says, uh, I thought we'd get more for Justin, but nobody valued him as a starter. And uh, let me let me share an opinion on, on what Flex is saying here. I think that it was just kind of a perfect storm against Justin Fields. The fact that you're going to see, you know, possibly five, six quarterbacks go in the first round. So there was a lot of quarterbacks available. The fact that there were some prominent uh, free agent quarterbacks, you don't typically see, you know, Russell Wilson available for $1.3 million. And so there was there was just things stacked. And as you, you said, Danny, Pulse played his cards wrong. So I think there are a lot of teams in the NFL who think Justin Fields has the potential to be a quality starter. But under the circumstances here, it, it just didn't proliferate in, in a, a scenario for a high draft pick. Yeah, I, I don't think teams don't view him as a starter. I, th- I think teams view him as a potential starter. I think teams view him as as, as a guy that that showed promise, that still has some developing to do. But I, I think, like I said, I think polls ruined it in terms of opening his mouth at, at the combine, kind of like everyone know that hey, we've made a decision, we're going this route. So I'm not saying why would I give you up a, a high value pick for a guy that you're eventually going to trade for nothing or even cut, you know, eventually. So I think what, what, what happened was, and then in terms of, you know, Kurt, Kurt cousin going to Atlanta, that took one, one, one team out of the, out of the picture. You know, we mm-hmm. talked about Russell Wilson going to Pittsburgh. It's like, all right, you know, we'll, for 1.2 million, we'll ride Russell Wilson and see what happens. You know, no big yeah. deal. We stopped picking on, on the roster. Um, 
and then, and then obviously, you know, with, with the, with the top three quarterbacks, you know, New England, you know, I think made the decision that, you know, we're just going to go take a quarterback. We're going to have Jacoby Purcell for, for one year and we're going to let this quarterback sit. And, and, and next year we'll start, we start fresh with him. So that took them out, out of the picture. Denver, it was never in a picture because Sean Payton and, and is, is not, is, is not a, 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 it's not a Justin Fields type of quarterback. He wants a, uh, like, like I said, like a guy who's accurate, quick twitch, you know, not a quick twitch, but a guy who can, you know, throw the ball quickly, process quickly. He doesn't, he doesn't want athletic quarterback. That's why it didn't work with Russell Wilson with, with Sean mm -hmm. Payton. Uh, Raiders, it wasn't going to work. The Raiders were never an option, guys. Luke Getze is their offensive coordinator. Luke Getze is never going to say, go get Justin Fields here. And Justin Fields is never going to want to go be with the Raiders. So they were never an option. So now you talk about, you know, once Atlanta got taken, and, and in Minnesota also, I think they also decided that, you know what? I honestly, I don't know if Ryan Poles would have the guts to trade him within the division. So I don't know if Minnesota ever sniffed at Justin Fields, but you know, imagine if if Ryan Poles trades into into the division, and then he comes back every two weeks or you know twice a year and, and kicks your ass. I think that that's Ryan Poles. Was, I think might, might have been too too afraid to do that too. So I don't know. I don't know if Minnesota was a, was a viable option as well. So, uh, but I think I think it just it was limited. It was limited to the Raiders. It was limited. I'm sorry. It was limited to, to the Patriots. It was limited to you know maybe Pittsburgh. You know if, if they didn't have that. You know they didn't have Russell Wilson. I think then when Kenny Pickett did his thing, where he said I'm not gonna. I don't want to. want out of here. That opened up another avenue now, and, and obviously then then the, the you know the talk went with Pittsburgh and, and they got what they got, but. The, like I said, the options were, were limited because of all the, the quarterback movement. And then also, I think Ryan Poles, like I said, blew it at the combine. He should just kept his kept it close to his chest, you know, not not said anything at all. Um, and and you know, they, they could have, you know, that could have been still that wonder. Hey, is are they still gonna go with Justin? You know, then the next thing you you could you could have popped some some leaks there with, with your friends in the media and saying, hey. Yeah. Bears are talking to the New England Patriots or Bears talking to the Giants about possibly moving up. Now like, oh, they might trade. They might keep Justin. Now we're like if you if you're a team that's interested in Justin, hey, hey, let, let's talk again about it. so but again, he just said when he says that we're gonna do right by Justin, you and I came on the air that, that, that the following day, I think it was, or same day. Yeah. He said, That's it. That, that the writing's on the wall. That that's, yeah, it's, it's over with. Yeah. If you and I can if you and I know that, that what that means, you right. think 31 other GMs don't know what that means. I know it's like you know he sh what he should have said is you know we're very happy with Justin's development we think that uh, he he's been showing steady progress over his three years we're very confident that in year four with the Chicago Bears he's going to have a great season now having said that we're 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 looking at every possible way to uh, improve our team and and leave it at that leave it at that leave it at that and you know and, and they say and the media kept peppering him if they kept peppering him, hey is is he a starter. As of right now, Justin Fields is our starting quarterback. Yes, just say that and leave it at that. And that doesn't doesn't preclude you from making the trade or it doesn't preclude you from going drafting quarterback. It just leaves you as letting the rest of the NFL know that your options are still open and Justin is still a viable option to be your starter. And that would help, you know, get other teams involved and and, and raise the raise the value, in my opinion. Right. The other defect in the in the trade, besides it being a six that could potentially be a four, is that the lack of draft picks this year, as you mentioned, Danny. That kills me. That kills yeah. me. Before, <laughs> I think it kills every Bears fan. So in my mind, I would have said to the Steelers, listen, let's let's split the difference. Give us a, your fifth from this year. And if Justin goes on to make the Pro Bowl – in 2024, you also send us a fourth in 2026. That, to me, would have been, you know, getting uh, – what I'm trying to say is getting some draft assets for this year's draft would have been better than, I think, what we got, which is two, you know, a, a pick in 2025. Well, I remember – I think about three weeks ago, I came on here and I said, I know someone who, who, you know, who I know who works in the NFL informed me that that if, if polls is smart, he would take – the the option you just hit take a, a day three pick this year a fifth round pick and then take a conditional pick for next year yeah. whether it's a, a fourth that could be a third or a third that could be a second depending on what justin does in terms of snaps in terms of touchdown passes and a bunch of incentives that can go from a fourth to a third to a second if justin met, met all these now you get your what your original asking price was which was a two and a five you just get it in reverse you get the you know that, that pick next year and you get the, the fifth round pick this year so Obviously, that, that didn't play out that way. And, and and the other thing is, and I know this is a very popular trade and everyone loved it, but the Keenan Allen trade kind of had me my head scratching. Now, again, 
he's a six-time Pro Bowl receiver, and I'm not putting down the 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 the, the player or, or the production or, or what he's done. But all right, Ryan Poles has been telling us for three years now he's going to make signings and he's going to make trades for guys that are entering their their peak years or guys that are that are they're you know in, in their in the middle of their peak years, right? Now, mm-hmm. Keenan Allen came off a, a great season last year. I, I, I'm not going to doubt the kid that. But he, he's 31, going to be 32, going into a, as, a April. as a free yeah. agent. He's missed 11 games the last two years. Okay? Mm-hmm. So he's a, he has a problem staying, staying healthy. So how is this jive with what, with what Ryan Poles has been, has been telling us? Now, the information came out today with – Keenan Allen being close with Caleb Williams, that could have played a role in it. That's some information I had no idea until today. Yeah. Maybe that, that played a part of it. But again, I'm a sure. fourth round pick for a guy that was going to get cut um, really kind of kind of you know bothered me initially because I mean the, the, the Chargers were going to cut him because he wasn't taking a pay cut. Now the other thing that I was told was was if the Chargers did cut him, Keenan Allen wasn't coming to Chicago. Keenan Allen was going to go in different. He's he's a West Coast guy. He went to Cal. He's been he's been in San Diego and in California for all his career. He lives in LA. That Chicago wasn't on his list to come to. So I think that might have been also played a factor. But that really kind of took me off guard in terms of another fourth, a fourth, and it's, and it's your fourth round pick, which is the higher of the two. <laughs> so I was like, you couldn't give him the, the the other one from Philly. You have to give him your your fourth round pick for a guy again that's that's going to be thirty two into a, into a contract season, and it's been missed the last eleven games and was going to get cut. So I, I I don't I don't this, when Ryan Poles makes trades it always gets me has my my head yeah. spinning and, and I'm like all right so now you only have four picks you traded a fifth round pick for Bates who was gonna get cut probably from Buffalo so you don't have that anymore so that's what I'm saying if you don't trade number nine I don't see wh- where where are they gonna go get 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 more you know draft capital May, and maybe he's gonna be okay with that maybe he's gonna then go into that third phase of free agency and get the edge rusher and and, and get get a defense tackle and, and fill it there I don't know. But I just I, I see those four picks and uh, I just I hate that. Yeah, I, I think you bring up some very good points there uh, regarding you know the Keenan Allen trade. I I, I do believe that the, their mind was made up that they were going to target Caleb and that they want to create a really welcoming environment. I as we said at the beginning of the show, I would not be surprised if they drafted you know uh, Taj Washington uh, out of USC to make that an even more hospitable uh, uh, offense for for Caleb. I think they're going to go out of their way, which is a a a, a uh, it's something the Bears have not done in the past. We've complained incessantly. You know, we drafted J- Justin Fields, we drafted Mitchell Trubisky, we tr- we traded a lot of assets for Jay Cutler, but we didn't help them. <laughs> you know, we, no. we were late to. We were late to build an offensive line. We were late to add wide receivers. It was terrible. So now it seems like they're maybe going a little bit too far on the other end, but they're doing it the right I mean, way. was all this for Justin, right? So you, you gave Justin a fair chance at that two years ago. So that's what I'm saying. Like you didn't give him a fair chance because because he wasn't he wasn't his guy and he was going to move on from him. But that's either near the hero there. That Justin's in Pittsburgh, great situation. Like I said earlier, it's done there. We're not going to argue that. But the the thing is, and my guy Cliff Victoria just added. You know, uh, Allen would be great, and, and and hopefully he is great. And I'm I'm not saying he's not going to be great. I'm not saying the guy hasn't been a tick time Pro Bowl. I'm just saying he's going to be 32 going into a, a free agent year. So are you going to sign him to a free agent contract? Are you going to give him an extension? So nope. so you give a fourth round pick for one season of Keenan Allen? Mm-hmm. That's that's exactly what I, what I foresee that this is. Yeah. Um, and no, particularly if, if if they draft one of the top three wide receivers, then it's then Allen is definitely a one year rental. And and then may oh, yeah, that's I think it's a fourth round pick. You know, fourth round picks can be starters in this league. And so yeah. so to, for for a one year rental, I mean, you could have gone sign uh, again. Not not the same caliber receiver. I understand, but a guy like Tyler Boyd, right? KJ Osborne just just signed with with the, the Patriots again. Not a caliber of receiver in terms of what he's done through his career, like a Keenan Allen. I understand that part, guys. But I'm saying like you could always add if you get a, a, a Roman Dunze at number nine, and now you have. A Tyler Boyd as your number three, and then you have Tyler Scott. Now that's still a, that's, that's still some talent, still some weapon there, right? So I uh, think, and, and the fact he's missed eleven games in the last two years really does bother me as well. So I, I, I just I just hate giving up draft picks. And then the top of that, it's your fourth round pick, which is higher of the two. Yeah, I got gotcha. that. 
Flex Diggs uh, says, Allen killed NFC North uh, teams last year. Yeah, I've got a video up on our YouTube channel, Look Barroom Network. Look under videos. You will see him have three outstanding games. against. He even played well against the Bears. But uh, what we're interested in is how well did he play against the Packers, Vikings, and Lions. And he had three outstanding games. The game against the Vikings was phenomenal. He had two touchdowns and threw for a, a touchdown pass to Mike Williams. Uh, so uh, hopefully he can continue that level of play. But I agree with you. They're not going to spend. They're not going to extend his contract. Uh, he's going to look for one last big payday before he retires. And I, I doubt he's going to get it from Ryan Poles. You, but you know what? On, on a, on a, a more funnier note, mm -hmm. uh, how, how shell shocked is is LA and, and Justin Herbert now with with Jim Harbaugh coming in and bringing his ground and pound offense? <laughs> so those those fantasy guys who always just uh, uh, draft Justin Herbert, guess what? Yeah. He's, he's doing a lot of JJ McCarthy. He's going to turn around, hand the ball off to 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 running backs, and he's 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 going to build that offensive line. But you know what? He's going to build a, a tough physical offense and defensive line. You notice he kept Mac and Bosa. He restructured their contracts and cut mm -hmm. Williams and and and, and traded Allen because right. he's going to build that that team in, in his image. And it's going to be a tough physical team, tough offensive line, tough defensive line, and eventually they're, they're going to start getting the weapons. Maybe they might draft. You know, if they stay at number five, they could draft neighbors. You could draft Nunze. So that you know that could be something that they look at there. But yeah, this is something that. Uh, um, the, the, Jim Harbaugh's coming in there, and, and, and this is his team, and he's got Greg Roman in there. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to be like that ground and pound offense there in, in, in L.A. And, and Herbert hasn't seen this, and, and the Charger fans haven't seen this in a long time. Yeah, it's going to be a whole new lifestyle for our Chargers fans, that's for sure. Well, he great. Right. Harbaugh will write that ship, and, and, and I told you, I made a prediction. Within three years, they will be playing for a Super Bowl, the Chargers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know about that. He'll be gone. He'll be gone in five, but but within three years he'll, he'll be suspended <laughs> within five. <laughs> I don't trust Jim Harbaugh. He comes out of that Bill Belichick school, you know, do anything to win, including cheat. So I, uh, I don't particularly like quarterbacks. You're not like trying that. if you're not cheating, right? Or how's it go? If you're not cheating, if you're not trying, or yeah, that that's the same. Yeah. That's the same. Well, well, then maybe the Bears should <laughs> cheat more often or or cheat at all. I don't know. Anything for a winner. And Flex says, Harbaugh is a winner. Danny agrees with you. I don't. He won what? Uh, he's never won a Super Bowl in the NFL. And he's he's won one national championship in football, and that was in his 10th year. Come on. He's a winner. Come on. But he, he took he took a, a, a more bound uh, San Francisco 49ers franchise after Mike Singletary, you know, depends in front of the whole locker room. All right, and, and he took them within a year. They're, they're contending for an NFC championship, and I think second year were in Super Bowl, or was it the first year they were in Super Bowl? I forgot. Uh, but within the first, second year, they were in a Super Bowl. First or second, they're, yeah. They're off to the Ravens, right? And and they're winning the game, correct me if I'm yeah. wrong, until yeah. that lights went out. The lights <laughs> went out, right. and then got cold and, and all that stuff, and weird, weird <laughs> things happened. But I'm telling you, this guy knows how to win, Aldo. And he knows how to win, and, and it, he rubs people the wrong way. To me, he's the football Tom Thibodeau. The former mm -hmm. Bulls coach, he was, he's win. He'll grind at you. He'll leave within five years. But damn it, within five years, you're gonna have a winning franchise. Yeah, Ray Lewis had some of his friends go cut the light out so that they can regroup. Uh, that's how that happened at Super Bowl. Danny, great job. Uh, many thanks to our guest, uh, Connor Morissette. If you missed the interview, check it out on demand. We're available on audio podcasts as well. Uh, Danny's breakdowns of these talent as Cliff Victoria says, you know, I really love the way Danny breaks these players down. And if you listen to the show on our audio only format, it's, it's perfect because we're not relying on any video. Danny is describing things. Uh, and you can draw your own images on that. Fantastic work, Danny. Next week, we're uh, going to look at who? Offensive tackles, the big boys. Okay. Uh, and our guest, I'm not sure who our guest is going to be. I think it's, no, in two weeks, it'll be Herb Howard. Uh, you requested Herb. I reached out to him. He's going to be on in a couple of weeks. But So I'm not quite sure who we got next week, but we'll have a good guest. And, Herb, uh, and I were, Herb and I were vibing, were vibing over Twitter because his, his takes and my takes were, were very similar with Justin. It's like, 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 let's calm down. Let's, let's, stop, let's stop berating <laughs> this kid and, and, and putting him down just because, you know, you, you, you're whatever. I, I guess I don't want to start it, but, but you know, I just uh, – no, the 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 vitriol or the, or the the back and forth 
between the the, the fields fans and I, I'm I'm one of one of them. But I mean, it, it's the decision was made by someone that you know, we can't control it, right? So they made the decision. It's there, you know. This 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 decision is is going to either you know get uh, polls uh, contract extension or it's it's going to cost him his job, just right. like when when Ryan Pace made the Trubisky you know a pick mm -hmm. over Deshaun Watson. I said that that he just you know basically sealed his, his fate and and it, it went down with with Trubisky. So Ryan Poles is, is going to ride with with Caleb Williams and we assume right and mm -hmm. uh, so we'll see how how it plays out. Yeah, I. Um... Yeah, we'll see. Because we, yeah, we, we could talk here for we, we're already two hours and fifteen minutes. We could talk here for another two hours easily. But uh, my only go thing, I wanna, one more thing is, is, is if you're sure. gonna do this, if you're gonna do this, and we talked about this, you and I and John talked about this. If you're gonna do this, reset at the quarterback position. Why keep the defensive minor head coach because he won seven games, six against losing losing teams? Is that mm -hmm. is that why? Because he improved the defense. See, this is what this is where if if because the the it's been set, right? The the uh, it, 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 they said that Kevin Warren polls have said it. They expect to compete this year and make the playoffs. Mm -hmm. So what if they miss the playoffs? So now you're going to fire Eberflus and his staff, and now you're going to bring in a whole new staff, and now they they inherit the quarterback you pick at number one. So it's right. the the rinse and repeat. It's the same thing over and over again. Like if you're gonna if you're gonna do this, you should just start it off and guide yourself an offensive mind head coach that can go ahead and. You know, tutor and 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 develop this this young this young quarterback. So right. we'll see what happens well, here. But. This is definitely a big year for Matt Eberflus. I think that Ryan Poles, uh, no matter what happens, unless something catastrophic happens, they look absolutely horrible. But I think Ryan Poles is going to stick around. Yeah. Uh, and but it's Eberflus who is in the hot seat now. He's got that rookie quarterback, so you can kind of rely on that as an excuse. But if you don't improve your one loss record over the 2023 one loss record, then there has to be uh, a, a sacrifice done, and I think it would be Eberflus the defensive. I, I, although I don't, I, I remember correctly, I don't even think it's the win loss record. I think they said playoffs. I think they expected to make the playoffs. Mm, well, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know if it's Poles or Kevin Warren. They said that they expected to be in the playoffs next year. So yeah, that's that, the, that's the threshold. All right. And I think, you know, uh, this is a really tough di division to say that. And, you know, the right. Packers are, are definitely a legitimate team. We'll see if there's a drop-off in Jordan Love's second year after co coordinators have had a chance to study their tape. Uh, but the Lions are definitely a good team. And so, I don't know. What do you think about the Vikings? Do you think they're going to have a good 2023? I, I saw the Colin Vikings. Coward. The Vikings so, uh, improved their defense. Defensively, I think they're going to be good. So and, and I, obviously they they have no running game right now. So so if they turn into a, a if they bring in a rookie quarterback for example, whether it's Drake May or JJ McCarthy, whoever, right. and they and they because I don't think they're gonna well I should say they're gonna start Sam Donald, which mm -hmm. how he gets multiple chances I, I have no idea. Anyway, they're gonna start Sam Donald and they're gonna eventually get this rookie quarterback in and, and, and start. So if they go with a defense run game heavy. Type of type of system, um, you know. I, I think they could they could you know trug along there and, and be competitive. I, I don't think they're going to bottom out. I don't think they're going right. to unless Sam Donald is a disaster and the, the rookie is just not ready to start. Um, I, I don't think they're going to bottom out. I think their defense is good enough. And if, if they get a, a running game, Kevin O'Connell is is a one of the you know bright young you know offensive coordinators. Another guy that I was I was touting for head coach when the Bears were looking for head coach before they hired Eberflus was Kevin O'Connell. So if the Bears would just listen to me, we'd be in so much better shape right now. <laughs> That's but, true. Uh, but anyway, so Kevin O'Connell is a hell of a play caller. I think I think they could trug along and be competitive. So mm -hmm. I, I don't see them bottoming, bottoming me out, bottoming me out, bottoming out uh, yeah. this year. So it depends on yeah. what happens, obviously, with the quarterback. So it's going to be a very tough challenge. We'll see. Uh, I think the uh, – NFL schedule comes out in early May, so as soon as that's out, that's going to you know hopefully give us a clear picture. And of course, the NFL draft before that. Um, I've also so, heard something that I have not been able to confirm though. But so this is just take it for a grain of salt. But the, the NFL is really, really pushing the Bears to be on hard knocks this year. Really, because Ooh. of the streak with Caleb, the first oh. overall pick, and. Some of the improvement they made, their young, young up and coming team with you know, obviously with DJ and Keel Allen. They, they got some, they got some, some name, power name, some name power there now, and they're trying to trying to push them. But I don't know if the McCaskies don't want to do it. So, 
Oh, no, they don't want to do it. And, you know, they're going to come back and say, yeah, you know, the rule says that you don't have to do it if you have a new head coach. But we've got two new coordinators. We've got a brand new quarterback. We need to be totally focused on. And, you know, from that perspective, I could see the NFL saying, okay, but next year for sure. Uh, or what if yeah. they say, hey, we, you want help with that stadium? Could that be something that they could dangle in front of the Bears? Perhaps. I, I don't know if, if the value in return of having them on hard knocks is is good enough. Now, maybe, you know, they do that in-season show where it starts like around week nine, uh, a hard knocks in-season. On HBO, HBO, yeah. 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 So, yeah. which I, I saw last season, and it was uh, the Cardinals. I thought it was really well done. I mean, they always do a good job, NFL Films. What do you guys think of the uh, the new uh, Eberflus look? I like it. You see the the, 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 the new the, the, the style, the, the beard, yes, the hair. His wife. You, you, know, you, you watch him today? He had like this drawstring hanging down to his, his knees. Like, what the hell are you doing with that? I didn't, I didn't notice know. that. Like, dude, like, either tie that or, or stick it in your pants. Like, what? It's like literally hanging down to his knees. He must have left on, his man. wife at home. He's the one that's been styling him up. Uh, <laughs> but, I, you know, one of the things that I'm worried about with this team is the head coach and because you look at all the head coaches from Super Bowl teams over the last generation or so, and they're all, you know, guys, if they've been to the Super Bowl more than once, they're all head coaches who are going to the Hall of Fame or will be close picks. And I look at Eberflus, I don't see a Hall of Fame quality coach there, but maybe maybe he'll prove me wrong, hopefully. You see that the, I don't know if you saw the new rules that they're proposing for special teams. Special teams. I, I, I sure hope Richard Hightower is taking notes because Matt Eberflus is going to be confused as all hell. <laughs> That's right. Well, now you can't kick an onside kick until the fourth quarter, and you got to tell him. You tell the referee you gotta, to get an kick. Yeah. Right. And you and you and the kicker the, the kicker lines up at thirty five. The uh the the the, the wedge or the, the the blockers are now on the opposite forty. It's 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 all different. There's a kick zone, drop zone, all that other stuff. It's it's crazy. And they're they're they want to do away with the hip. What's it called when when you hip, tackle hip from tackle. the hip? Uh, drop yeah. hip tackle? Yeah, right. but, and that, uh, NFLPA today. The yeah, NFLPA is fighting that. So that that's, that's right. something that they're not gonna because it, I think it's it's a fifteen hour penalty and automatic first down. NFLPA says we're not we're not gonna allow that. So. Mm-hmm. Which I found a little shocking because that's for safety for the players. A lot of players are getting hurt that way. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Cliff asked, "What do you think about the Bears being in the Hall of Fame game?" And he asked earlier. I forgot to ask this question. His behalf. What do you think about Caleb playing all of the preseason games? I don't. Know, I don't think he'll play in the Hall of Fame game. I, I. I think that. But I think the Bears will play in the Hall of Fame game because they have. They have obviously McMichael and Hester going in, uh, and um, and Peppers. And Peppers. So I, I think the Bears will play in the Hall of Fame game. I just don't see – I don't think Kale Williams will play in the Hall of Fame game. Yeah, I doubt it too. I mean, I'd love to see him get as many reps as possible, but you gotta, you got to be careful. Got to be careful. All right, everybody, that's it for this edition of Draft on Tap. We'll be back here next Wednesday. Make sure you let, tell people that they can find our stuff here at the Barroom Network on YouTube. All they have to do is subscribe to our channel. They'll get the alerts on their device. Danny, again, great job, and many thanks to Connor Morissette. We'll see you all next week, everybody. Bye-bye.